Salam sejahtera and good day everyone. The Honourable Professor Technologist Dr. Salmia Kasolang, Rector, University of Technology Mara, Cawangan Pulau Pinang, Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin, Head of Centre of Studies, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University of Technology Mara, Cawangan Pulau Pinang, Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr. Azla Azmi, the Advisor of Program, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University of Technology Mara, Cawangan, Pulau Pinang, Encik Zamri Ahmad, the Advisor of Program, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University of Technology Mara, Cawangan, Pulau Pinang, Malaysia, the Executive Members of University of Technology Mara, Distinguished Speakers, Professor Dr. Dalen J. Timothy, Professor Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions, Arizona State University, United States of America, Professor Dr. Dharma Putra, Professor, Faculty of Humanities, Udayana University, Bali, Indonesia, and Honorary Professor, School of Languages and Culture, University of Queensland, Australia, Dr. Desi Fan, Senior Lecturer, Department of Hospitality and Tourism, Burntmouth University, United Kingdom, Mr. Muhammad Dawood Muhammad Arif, Chief Executive Officer, Malaysia Healthcare Travel Council, Malaysia. Mr. James Bevans, General Manager, Marriott International Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Hang, Associate Professor, Dr. Johanuddin Wahab, 
the moderator from Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, UITM Chawangan Pulau Pinang. Committee members, fellow academicians, participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to International Postgraduate Webinar, Hospitality, Tourism and Global Issues. In today's webinar, our esteemed speakers will share a very interesting and important topic with us entitled Preparing Industry Towards Possible Unexpected Events Lessons During COVID-19 Pandemic. To those who had just logged in and have not registered, kindly register your participation with us in the link that posted in the chat box below. This webinar is also live streamed via Facebook and YouTube, UITM Chawang and Palopina, you may find the link given in the chat box. Participants are highly encouraged to utilize the chat box for any comments or questions made during presentation in order not to disrupt presentation. Out of respect to the speakers, we request all participants to kindly switch on your cameras. Next, all participants are highly encouraged to use virtual backgrounds that have been shared to your email. My name is Mohammad Najmi and I am your Master of Ceremony for this webinar today. Before we proceed, we would like to call upon Head of Center of Studies, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University of Technology Mara, Chawangan Pulau Pinang, Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazal Harifin to deliver his welcoming speech. Hari ini, insya Allah, kabar baik. Alhamdulillah, and of course, last but not least, uh, Dr. Desi Fan, Senior Lecturer, Department of Hospitality and Tourism, Bournemouth University, UK. How are you doing today, madam? Hi, uh, how are you? I'm nice good, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully all of you are doing well today. It is great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this webinar. And of course, for your information, this webinar is part of the course requirement for hospitality and tourism current issues for master's level. So instead of going for a webinar, they also can uh, organize a webinar, it's either or. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you from different parts of the world to come to for this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, during the pandemic COVID-19, I believe okay, we, have, we have been to this uh, many epidemic, many pandemic for that matter. Our industry will bounce back. I always believe that. So this is the time okay, in, in, in business strategy, this is the time the industry retrain, learn, relearn, retrain their employees. Maybe you could um, uh, do some uh, uh, maintenance job in your uh, uh, organization. And this is one way of we want to fully utilize during this time. And of course, there is a blessing of these guys. This pandemic, I mean, um, allow us okay, to be connected 24 seven all over the world because we are digital nomad. We are connected and of course, 
I believe that uh, in USA, you are now in one, uh, 1 a.m. in the morning and UK uh, minus eight uh, hours from today, uh, from now. So of course we are connected all over the world because we are digital nomad. Having said that, okay, I would like to congratulate Associate Professor Dr. Azila Azmi, uh, the program or the course uh, lecture for organizing this event. Then we hope that all of us will benefit from this discussion today. Till then, of course, I always say this, sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Till then, hasta la vista, hasta luego, ciao, assalamu alaikum. Pass to you, Najmi. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin for the welcoming speech. Now, we would like to call upon Professor Technologist Dr. Salmia Kasola, Rector, University of Technology Mara, Chawangan, Pelopina, to deliver an opening remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Najmi, as the MC for today. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba. The Honorable Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin, uh, Head of Center of Studies, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, uh, University of Technology Mara, Chawangan, Pulau Pinang, Malaysia. Associate Professor Dr. Azila Azmi, the advisor of program, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University of Technology Mara, Chawangan Pulau Pinang, uh, the executive members of University of Technology Mara, UITM Pulau Pinang. Our distinguished esteemed speakers, um, Professor Dr. Dallin J. Timothy, Professor, Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions, uh, Arizona State University, United States of America, Professor Dr. Dharma Putra, Professor, Faculty of Humanities, Udayana University, Bali, Indonesia, and Honorary Professor, School of Languages and Culture, University of Queensland, Australia. Uh, Dr. Daisy Pan, Senior Lecturer, Department of Hospitality and Tourism, Bournemouth University, United Kingdom, Mr. Muhammad Dawood Muhammad Arif, Chief Executive Officer, Malaysia Healthcare Travel Council, Malaysia. Mr. James Bevens, I hope I pronounce it right. General Manager, Merit International, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And Associate Professor Dr. Johan Nuddin uh, Wahab, the moderator from Faculty of uh, Hotel and Tourism Management, UITM Pahang, Pulau Pinang. Committee members, the local admissions, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Again, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good afternoon. Alhamdulillah, let us extend our sincere gratitude to Allah SWT for giving us this opportunity to be here today. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome you to today's International Postgraduate Webinar Hospitality and Tourism Global Issues that is preparing industry towards foreseeable uh, unexpected events, lessons during COVID-19 pandemic which is hosted by postgraduate students of hospitality management, faculty of hotel and tourism management, University of Technology Mara, Chawangan, Pulau Pinang, and Puncha Alam. First and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all the eminent uh, speakers. We have Professor Dr. Dallin J. Timothy, Professor Dr. Dharma Putra, Dr. Desi Pen, uh, Mr. Muhammad Daud, Muhammad Arif, and Mr. James Bivens. Uh, indeed, a meeting of this nature is not only timely, but much needed in the present landscape of issues and challenges facing this pandemic era. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation and willingness to share your knowledge and expertise in this webinar. Not forgotten, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to the Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, uh, UITM Chawan Pinang, the webinars team for all their hard work in making this uh, international postgraduates webinar a success. Congratulations, I'm truly happy. Uh, everyone um, uh, is giving their utmost commitment to realize all the efforts and programs planned. Uh, this active synergy is crucial for UITM to move forward and uh, go internationally in line with the mission as, and aspiration of UITM. UITM is built up upon a um, foundation of three values, uh, which are uh, excellence, uh, synergy, and uh, integrity. So synergy is one of the uh, things I think uh, being, uh, uh, being promoted today or being realized. 
Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share about University of Technology Mara. UITM is the largest university in Malaysia. It was established in 1956. We have 13 branches all around Malaysia, comprises of one main campus and 34 satellite campuses, uh, UITM Shah Alam Selangor. The main campus becomes the center of administration. Currently, we have around 190,000 enrollment of students. I repeat, 190,000. You don't normally see this kind of numbers in a university, but yeah, we do have uh, that number of students. Um, and enrollment of students in comprising of um, uh, diploma, bachelor, master's, and PhD. In University of Technology Mara, we strive to be among the top universities not only in this country, but in the world. Uh, we uh, aspire to be a uh, globally renowned university. That is our vision. And then unleashing the potential, shaping the future. That uh, is actually our motto. Uh, concerted efforts are put forward to improve staff and students' productivity through regular webinars, seminars, workshops, and other research-related activities. Although the current COVID-19 pandemic has generally weigh down some physical activities, various initiatives were taken to motivate students and staff to um, continue uh, actively in writing, publishing uh, a smart partnership, uh, CSR, innovation, and many more during this challenging time. And so an example of such an initiative is this international postgraduate webinar program, which we are having. Now. The advancement of internet in internet technology is a great blessing. It allows us to gather safely on this virtual platform. We are very grateful to have all the speakers with various academic backgrounds, plus with a splendid experience that will benefit educationally, culturally, and practically through invaluable knowledge and insights. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt that the fear and uncertainty that have emerged from unforeseen event of COVID-19 have uh, psychologically, uh, physiologically, and emotionally uh, have changed the global landscape. Tourism is one of the sectors most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, impacting economies, livelihood, public services, and opportunities on all continents. All parts of its value uh, chain have been affected. World Tourism Organization, UNWO, reported that tourism support one in 10 jobs and provides livelihoods for many millions more in both developing and undeveloped uh, and developed economies. In Malaysia, many hotels shuttered while some travel agencies and businesses ordered as their funds dried up. Uh, sorry, as their funds yeah, dried up. Uh, for this reason, UITM is one of the human capital providers. We provide about 40% of the need of the country. Um, we will continue uh, to contribute and support for any recovery and strategic plan to rescue the economy and for the survival of, of mankind as a whole. Before I end my speech, once again, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all the speakers and participants. I sincerely hope you will find this webinar rewarding. Stay safe and may you have a fruitful mm -hmm. webinar. For that, I announce the opening mm -hmm. of International Postgraduate Webinar, Hospitality and Tourism Issues, Preparing mm -hmm. Industry mm -hmm. Towards Foreseeable and Expected Events, Lessons from COVID-19 Pandemic. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Mr. MC. Thank you very much, Professor Technologist Dr. Sal Salmiya Kasola, for the wonderful opening remarks. Members of the webinar, before we begin with the main highlights for today, allow me to share a brief introduction about the moderator, Associate Professor Dr. Joharuddin Wahab. Associate Professor Dr. Joharuddin is an Associate Professor of Service Management and Hospitality Management within the Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management. University Taranji Mara, Chawangan, Pulau Pinang. Dr. Johanuddin is also a regular reviewer to the International Hospitality and Tourism Postgraduate Conference, Chairman to the International Hospitality and Tourism Conference 2014, Penang Chapter, Editorial Board Member to Esteemed Journal, UITM Penang, Editorial Board to Journal of Tourism, Hospitality and Culinary Arts, 
and recently appointed as editorial board to Journal of Tourism, Hospitality and Environment Management and international editor to the International Journal of Business Studies at the University of Petra, Surabaya, Indonesia. Without further ado, let us welcome Associate Professor Dr. Johanuddin Wahab. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Najmi, for uh, the introduction. Uh, first and for all, I would like to welcome all distinguished uh, guests today and I would like to welcome all the participants from all over the world. And I've heard that I was informed that uh, we have participants from uh, South Africa, we have uh, participants from the United States, we have uh, participants from the United Kingdom, uh, Asia, and all over the world. And thank you very much for participating in this international webinar. All right. So uh, as a uh, uh, for a reminder, everyone, yeah, I think uh, we have announced the uh, webinar etiquette and rules and regulations. And uh, without uh, uh, further ado, I would like to, uh, the first speaker that I would like to introduce, yeah, uh, first one is Professor Dylan J. Timothy. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, to all participants, uh, Professor Dylan J. Timothy. Dr. Dallin is a professor in the School of Community Resources and Development at Arizona State University. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography from Brigham Young University, Master's in Geography from the University of Ontario, and PhD in Geography from the University of Waterloo. His research interests in tourism include heritage, community-based planning, political boundaries, and supranationalism shopping and consumption, peripheral and rural regions, and research in developed countries, and the last one is about religiously motivated travel. All right, today, uh, Prof. Dallin is going to share with us uh, his insight on a topic entitled The Post-COVID-19 Pandemic Marketing Strategy to Reinforce the Tourism Economy. Without further ado, I would like to call the distinguished guest, Prof. Dallin Jetumati. Over to you, Prof. Dallin. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Dr. Johannadine, and uh, uh, it's a real honor to be here with everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Salmia and Associate Professor Hashim for your introductory remarks, and also to you, Najmi, for your uh, emceeing job on this um, wonderful webinar. It was great to have an opportunity to come back to UITM. I don't know if you're aware, I was a visiting professor at yes. UITM. Yeah for several years in um, Shalam, and it's really nice to be back in uh, Malaysia, even virtually. I wish I could be there physically and maybe someday soon. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, again, I appreciate this opportunity. It's nice to meet everyone and nice to see everyone. Let me see if I can get this to work. I'm going to try to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes. The yeah. slide presentation? Okay. Yes, we can see that, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I've been asked to uh, talk about post-COVID recovery marketing. And this is a very interesting topic, obviously, uh, that we're all facing now. We're all dealing with uh, the effects of the current pandemic. And of course, we've had many other crises and many other disasters. billions of dollars in revenue. Millions of employees have been laid off from their employment. Tourism dependent communities have suffered huge economic and social consequences, not just economic. 
government spending has increased, which will likely result in higher taxes and higher deficits. And then, of course, stress-related illnesses have increased and social problems have also increased as a result of this pandemic. And so clearly this has been a major, um, if has had major effects on all aspects of society and economic growth and development. Um, and of course, we're most interested today in talking a little bit about tourism. Some signs of hope. The, the news headlines in recent weeks have, or last month or two, and then of course I updated this, I was looking just this week about on um, what are some of the good news items that are happening? What are we starting to see from a hopeful perspective? We're starting to see that borders are beginning to open up. Destinations are beginning to welcome tourists, some with tests, proof of vaccination, quarantines. Some destinations are allowing arrivals without any requirements whatsoever. We're starting to see demand for air travel, at least in the United States. The last statistic of last Monday was that demand for air travel is now higher in the United States than it was before the pandemic. So this is primarily domestic travel, but you know, this is a very large country. And so there's a lot, there's always been a lot of domestic travel here. And this is a sign of some kind of recovery. Airlines are beginning to start new routes that they have not served before. And this is also a good sign. The airlines that were affected so badly by this um, year and a half lockdown are now opening enough to they're actually initiating new uh, flights, which is quite interesting, even though they haven't fully recovered yet. And more people are getting vaccinated and infection rates are declining in many places in the world. And that is, again, that's been part of the reason why so many borders have opened up. There are some very encouraging headlines that I was able to find. So you can see Heathrow to offer fast track screening for vaccinated lists arrivals. Disneyland Paris reopens. Langkawi plans reopening for fully vaccinated visitors. Cruise ships are returning to Costa Rica in September. Iberia launches Maldives flight. An H Hotel group introduces smart table touchless guest processing and Germany list travel ban from UK. So these are just a few headlines that I was able to see in the travel news over the last week that show some sort of hope for the future and some sort of hope for recovery. So I think most of you are familiar with the concept of recovery marketing. And I'd like to review with you some of the um, strategies that are commonly used that, that many destinations or companies find um, effective in their efforts. This one is what I've called, this is my own term, suspended marketing. And so suspended, what I mean by sustain, suspended marketing is that destinations or companies, and I'll, in this case, I'll refer to destinations, this is basically um, a preemptive effort of destinations to try to create an image of themselves during the times when nobody is coming there. And so we know, and I'll show you some examples in a minute, but basically um, this was very, very common in the beginnings about a year ago, from last March to last July of last year. During the early days of the pandemic, this was very, very common to do this kind of suspended marketing. And I think you'll get a, you'll understand what I mean in just a minute. <laughs> um, so it's not too late during this uh, pandemic and uh, during the recovery part of this pandemic at any time to be, um, to in initiate this suspended marketing. For example, here's some examples, South Dakota in the United States. So it's a state in the United States, of course, Las Vegas. Everyone knows Las Vegas and the state of Oregon. So I use these as examples of destinations that have adopted this idea of suspended marketing. So here is a marketing um, scheme that the, the state of South Dakota developed. And you can't read it very well down in the small part here at the bottom, but it's basically saying great places are waiting. It says, it took 75 million years of rain and wind to carve the peaks and spires of Badlands National Park. And then, when you are ready to travel, 
it will be waiting. That's the quote here. So it's kind of this idea that we're trying to encourage people to hope for the future. Maybe you can't come here now, but you can remember us. And you can see what beautiful uh, nature and culture we have. So I refer to this as suspended marketing because you're really marketing an image, not just a destination for now, but for the future. And there are many different um, examples. And here's some that I found on the internet that I think are quite fascinating. So up at the left, you see Bologna in Italy. It's an ad that says, stay home and travel tomorrow. Uh, Fort Worth is a city in Texas. It says, y'all stay home because it's our responsibility to stay healthy. And on the right, you've got the Greek, a Greek ad for Discovery Greece. And it says, until you can come back, stay safe. And then, of course, visit Estonia later. And then, of course, the Marriott company had this ad, which is, we will travel again. And just a couple more, because I wanted to show you some of the variety of these. The one in the upper left corner, stay home, dream online. And that's from Madeira, the Portuguese island. And of course, in Egypt on the upper right, stay safe. Um, thank you to those who stay home. And then we're sending love from across Canada. We can't wait to welcome you later. And then stay strong, visit Maldives later. So these are some examples, I think some really good, powerful examples of this sort of this unique form of marketing that says, please remember us. Please don't come now because we don't want to spread this disease. But when we're able to travel, please come and see us. Another type of marketing, of recovery marketing that's fairly common is referred to as early bird marketing. And this is basically how does a destination position itself with regard to planning ahead? so that when the disaster or the pandemic in this case is over, where are we going to be? Do we want to be the first destination that tourists will think about visiting when they're able to travel? So this is a very key position. It's about positioning, it's about marketing. Okay? It's about that suspended marketing that I mentioned before. But it requires careful planning at least two or three or four years in advance. As a, desti as a destination, where do we want to be in the marketplace when the market opens again? So <clears throat> the plan should be for any destination to be the foremost destination on travelers' minds in 2022, 2023, 2024, and so on. And so this does take a lot of careful planning and that idea of suspended uh, marketing plays an, an important part in this. It's also important in recovery marketing to provide assurances of assurances to potential visitors that your destination is safe. So it's very important in planning for um, the future to do everything in the destination's power to ensure that guests have a safe and pleasant experience. To ensure that all health requirements and healthy practices such as sterilization, masks, touchless processing, for example, are implemented and ensured to make guests feel safe, obviously, and visitors. And then something that we're starting to see more now is to digitize as much as possible, more contactless um, interaction with people will help provide these assurances that we are a healthy destination, we're ready to receive you, et cetera. Another perspective on recovery marketing is what we refer to as, obviously you've all heard the term, rebranding. And clearly we have the issue of branding. Rebranding is necessary when we have um, breaks or we have interruptions in tourism. And so in this case, obviously we're talking about a really big disruption. So rebranding is a very careful um, effort, a multi-sectoral effort to try to create, again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, a healthy destination, the image of a healthy destination. The pandemic might provide opportunities to rethink our destination or organizational goals and branding efforts. So not everything about the pandemic is terrible. Most everything is. 
but it can give us an opportunity as a destination or a service provider, a company, to take the opportunity to rethink what we're offering and how we are marketing and how we are providing services. We also have to consider reorienting the product. This is something that I found to be very, very interesting as I've studied the effects of, of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year. Museums are very good examples. And I've seen this adapted in many different museums, such as the National Museum of Singapore, the Vienna Museum, and various others. Some museums are now opening COVID-19 exhibits or displays. They're integrating the pandemic into their collections and narratives. So the pandemic itself is now becoming part of the heritage of destinations and part of the world's heritage in terms of um, the way that museums are sort of heritageizing it a little bit. So that's quite interesting fact too, something I've read about recently. Another tactic that it's often used is reorienting the market. And identifying new niches, this is key in, in refreshing the, the brand, refreshing our, our uh, product anyway. But during the pandemic and after the pandemic, I think it's important that destinations and service providers, um, <clears throat> hospitality providers, identify new niches. A lot of places have begun to focus on domestic tourism whenever possible. It's typically, in most places, domestic travelers have, travel has been allowed, whereas international travel hasn't. Encouraging citizens to explore their home countries, something that a lot of people haven't really considered in the past as a lucrative market, although it is. This can be done, obviously, encouraged by special rates and packages and promoting day trips and special events, such as art shows, film, uh, film shows, and things like that. On the right, you'll see this Arizona where I live. Um, it's, a, it's a marketing campaign called Rediscover Arizona, something that the state has done to try to encourage Arizonans to stay within Arizona and explore their own state. Um, another two, I'm sorry, we're having a, we're having a major um, monsoon storm here right now, and that's just a warning from the government. And we, the, the trees are pounding a lot against my window, so hopefully you can't hear it too much. Um, so promote activities in places that allow visitors to, to distance physically, such as remote areas, a lot of outdoor activities, virtual tours. A lot of places are offering virtual tours, and that becomes a conversion tool, tools that can be used by destinations to say, look, remember when you toured our facility or when you toured our canyon or our rainforest? When we're able to travel, come back now and experience those things in person. So virtual tours are becoming a very big product as well. As you can see on the right, Escape to Puerto Rico virtually. Here's one on the left from China. Um, visit Greece, experience Greece from your home and discover Norway. And finally, recovery marketing strategies. Another, the final one I wanna talk about is social media blasting. And social media, as the research shows, is the least expensive and probably the most effective way of marketing and of branding companies and destinations. It is inexpensive, it's global, it's influential, it is instantaneous. And so a good part of remarket, uh, recovery marketing could be um, social media blasting. I know I'm out of time, so I'll just conclude very briefly here. Past experience has shown that destinations and businesses can recover from disasters and crises. It takes a lot of work. It's rather expensive in most cases, but it, it's effective and there are ways of doing it. And I've given some suggestions of, of the work that I've done, the observations I've made uh, during the pandemic, but also from previous disasters. Although crises create many problems, they can also provide opportunities to rethink our product, to rethink our services, and maybe to reorient or rebrand or identify new niches. However, recovery marketing isn't easy. It requires a lot of collaboration, coordination, and diligent planning. It requires rethinking how tourism was before and what will it look like after. It requires being adaptable and being willing to reorient our service provision. What, what it is we have to offer. It also requires a certain level of risk. It provides an opportunity to rebrand and reconsider the marketplace, maybe tapping into markets that we hadn't thought of before as being very lucrative. It provides an opportunity for a destination or service provider 
to become more competitive in the industry. Let's see. Oh, good timing. So uh, I think that that kind of gives you the, the general perspective on what I wanted to share today. Um, just some of the thinking I've had on recovery marketing in the post-pandemic period. And I think a lot of you probably have a lot more experience in the hands-on perspective on marketing than I do. But I do study a lot of uh, success stories and try to learn from those. And hopefully that's been insightful for you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan, for your uh, insight. Uh, I just would like to... Uh... I would like to read the, uh, I have a question for you, I have two, uh, three questions for you. As I read uh, in front of me, I'm looking at the statistics of the Was the economy of the United States uh, towards this this pandemic? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. <clears throat> Obviously, it's been devastating, and uh, the United States is a large country, and there's parts of the United States that are more dependent on tourism than other places, and they have been completely devastated. Places such as um, Las Vegas, Florida, California, um, a lot of the major destination regions in the United States have been devastated. And a lot of small businesses have gone bankrupt and a lot of, there's been a lot of problems and a lot of, um, particularly small and medium enterprises really have been hit the hardest. And so uh, fortunately now things are on the recovery side and now most many countries are opening to Americans because from the outbound perspective, a lot of countries are now open to, opening to Americans because the US now has one of the lowest infection rates, which is good news. Um, but there's still a lot of, you know, only half the population of the United States has been vaccinated. It should be much, much higher than that. But there's a lot of stubborn people, and it's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, so from an outbound perspective, I think a lot more places. In fact, this morning I was looking at the list of countries that are um, welcoming American tourists, and it's growing every day. There's uh, more countries involved. And like I mentioned in the first slide, some countries are requiring COVID tests or vaccinations or quarantines. Others are not. Some of them just are welcoming welcoming Americans with no, um, uh, what am I saying, with no restrictions. Uh, but in terms of arrivals, it has been very, very devastating. But not just international tourism arrivals, but even during the periods when we weren't allowed to eat in restaurants or when we weren't allowed to go to the parks and things like that. It's been very, very hard. And um, it really has hit. Unfortunately, the poorer people tend to be the ones who get even poorer in this sort of situation. And so it's disproportionately affecting small businesses and family-run businesses and here and I think everywhere, not, yeah. not just here. So how about the econ economic stimulus package that is provided by the United States government towards this SME and all this? I think that it's overall, it's been quite helpful. It's allowed some of the SMEs to stay alive. Um, I think it's been abused a lot by, um, by some of the larger corporations who didn't need the money as much as the smaller companies. And so uh, the system may be good. It's caused a lot of debt, more debt for the country and deficit. Yeah. But it has helped a lot of small companies keep their employees, for example, keep their lights on, keep their doors open. Um, there has been a bit of abuse and misuse of that money, as I said, by certain larger companies that didn't need it, but they received it anyway. So I do believe it's been a, a very good uh, blessing for the small, um, small entrepreneurs, for sure. All right. Thank you, Dylan, for, for your uh, last questions for this, uh, uh, for you. Uh, I have this from the participants, yeah? Um, all right, so the next question is, uh, what are the best way to market a destination after pandemic period and the simple action that to be done by the government? Well, that's what my whole presentation was about. <laughs> so 
I think um, maybe the person asked the question before the presentation was really finished. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. But I think uh, basically it's all about being adaptable, being willing to look at different market segments. Um, it's being willing to uh, for the government to support, as you mentioned, Nodine, uh, it's important for the government to, yep. to support where possible, if possible, and to also give good benefits, like maybe tax breaks to, to companies to thrive, things like that. So the role of government is key. Something that's different from, say, Malaysia and the United States is the tourism industry in the United States is completely free of government. Yeah. Um, the government has really very little role to play in tourism. It's a complete free market, uh, business-oriented model. Whereas in most countries, there are government departments or government ministries over tourism. And that is not the case in the United States. And so uh, it's a slightly different model. It's more of a free market-driven uh, economic sector. There are policies, obviously, that affect tourism, but uh, not so much in the United States as in most other countries. But I think that the common marketing strategies, like I said, if you go back and review the slide presentation, or you know, adaptability, uh, preemptive marketing, yeah, uh, those sorts of things. And uh, what, one last question, uh, Dallin. So this is from uh, Sidi Tuka from Undira Bali. The question is, uh, how do you think about new model guest satisfaction standard based on your new model recovery marketing strategy? During or after the pandemic, is in is there any different strategy between foreign and national guests, tourists? You know, I'm not sure if there is a different strategy. Um, I know that a lot of places are becoming more aware of their specific markets, which is good. And I think that this could go one of two ways. Uh, post pandemic, I think that people really feel this what we call island fever. Everybody feels locked in. Everybody feels like we need to be free to travel again. And I think that yes. there's going to be a lot of demand for international travel. And so we might see a pretty large jump in international travel once the world opens up again more. But I still think, and, and so there may be higher levels of satisfaction. There may be um, lower levels of satisfaction because places are going to be overcrowded once again. I'm not sure about that. But also... Um, I do think that part of the recovery strategy with regard to domestic or national tourists versus international tourists is that there are cultural differences between tourism markets. And there's a lot of work, for example, on Chinese tourists around the world. And what are the expectations and the desires of Chinese tourists compared to, say, other Asian tourists or European tourists? And so I think it's very incumbent upon the destinations and the service providers to know their markets, know what their preferences are, and that's the key in creating satisfying experiences for both domestic and international visitors. Thank you, Dan, for your brief explanations about the uh, questions that we gave to you. And uh, thank you very much. So before this, before you leave, I think, uh, I think it's one o'clock, if you're not mistaken, 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, according to the moderator, uh, they would like to take a picture with you. Yeah, yeah. Can I do it? Please proceed. Is me? 
back as me? Have you taken the picture? Dr. Johan, uh, your voice is not clear. Testing. Yes. Okay, ready. All right, already. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, we go to the next page. One, two, three. Okay, the last page. One, two, three. All right, thank you. Thank you, Najmi. For Over to you again, Dr. Johan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Najmi. Thank you, uh, Professor Dallin. All right, so uh, next we would like to move to our second presenter for today. Uh, before that, I would like to read uh, uh, the uh, background of uh, our presenter. Next presenter is uh, Mr. Muhammad Daud Muhammad Arif. He's the Chief Executive Officer to the Malaysian Healthcare, Healthcare Travel Council. Mr. Muhammad Daud Muhammad Arif is the Chief Executive Officer of Malaysia Healthcare Travel Councils. Previously, he served as the Senior Director of Tourism Policy and International Affairs Division at the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture Malaysia and Lead Shepherd of the APAC Tourism Working Group. With 20 years of leadership, Mr. Muhammad Daud brings a fresh perspective to Malaysia healthcare growth, furthering the country vision to be the leading global healthcare destinations. All right. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Daud is uh, among the key person right at the moment uh, during the pandemic in Malaysia. And I have uh, actually many questions prepared to uh, uh, Mr. Muhammad Daud regarding what is actually going on in Malaysia right now. Uh, as we see yesterday, the numbers of uh, COVID-19 cases like surge going like over 9,000 cases. And I, I, I'm sure Mr. Daud is going to say something about that. And uh, his uh, presentation will be uh, covering the topic of uh, developing confidence and assurance for Malaysia as a trusted healthcare destination before and after the uh, pandemic. So over to you, uh, Mr. Daud. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, very good afternoon, good morning. Uh, at least some of, some of the places are so good night. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johan. Uh, and first and foremost, I would like to thank UITM uh, to uh, invite me. I think the organization of this webinar is very, very uh, done very well. Alhamdulillah. And uh, again, again, thank you so much. And as you rightly said, I'm a little bit more focused on one particular niche of tourism uh, promotion or offerings. Uh, the one that uh, Professor Timothy was explaining was uh, leisure travel. But going into medical travel is a bit more different in terms of the nature of the travel. Uh, and I will take the audience through my presentation with first to highlight some of the landscape of the Malaysia healthcare services. And secondly, we will go, uh, we'll dive in into the performance of Malaysia healthcare services uh, comparative to our neighboring countries. And then uh, I will also take you through how we manage uh, the COVID-19 pandemic vis-a-vis -vis the services of healthcare that we provide, and finally, how do we plan uh, to move out or to rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic. So the next slide, if I, if I may, to start off is, okay, uh, first and foremost, the Malaysia Healthcare is uh, established national agenda, and we are very lucky that our government uh, take this as one of the sector which can contribute to economic recovery. Previously, the government or Malaysia has always been focusing on manufacturing. Now we are moving into services as well to balance the economic development. And, and I'm very proud to see that healthcare services, especially for international uh, patients, have been put as a priority area for economic development of the country. And what MHTC is, is being established for is very crucial. Not many countries has an establishment like Malaysia Healthcare Travel Council. And we are a body where dedicatedly to promote Malaysia as a destination for healthcare services throughout the region and as well as for global market. So we work very closely with the private hospital in terms of branding, promotion and services uh, and, and promoting our quality services all over the world. 
Secondly, our function is also to facilitate and coordinate the ecosystem that we have in Malaysia to guarantee a seamless journey for patients who come into Malaysia. So when patient comes to Malaysia, MHTC try to get all the industry players together and, and create an unforgettable, unforgettable experience for the patient so that they feel safe, they feel comfortable, and they are happy here in Malaysia and they can become our advocate into the future. I will get into more detail about these functions later on in my subsequent slide. We can go into the next slide. This is uh, the profile of healthcare travel, if I can indeed explain a little bit to garner some understanding of the audience. First and foremost, who are our healthcare travelers? There are two big components. Number one is health tourists. These are people who come to Malaysia dedicatedly to seek healthcare services, or tourists who come here for leisure traveler, and at the same time, they will provide or allocate time for some treatment, medical treatment in Malaysia. Number two, our focus group will be the foreign patients in Malaysia themselves. So these are inclusive of expatriate, foreign student, uh, Malaysian my second home, participation, participant, including foreign workers as well. These are two big components which are very important because in order to contribute to the economic development, they are the ones who bring in foreign currency into the country, but with more so that they can enjoy the facility and excellent services that we can provide them. In terms of market share, as you can see on the middle of the slide, uh, Indonesia has always been our, our major market, including China and India, which is the top three. And you can see other markets that we are also looking at are uh, from Bangladesh to Pakistan to United Kingdom and Nepal. Most of these uh, source countries are within our region, except for one or two, which is quite far. Because when it comes for medical services, it is usually from the nearby country who comes to, to, to avoid high cost of travel and also to seek critical medication uh, or medical treatment uh, within the vicinity of, of three to four hours flight. What kind of services that they always come to Malaysia for? Mainly we have uh, oncology, we have uh, cardiology, fertility treatment, health screening, urology. These are some of the top treatment that patients come to Malaysia for their, uh, their, their services. Next slide. So how do we work? Uh, we mainly work with private hospital. Uh, and our, we have 74 member hospitals who are registered and a paid, paying annual fee that works with us very closely. So this, this is a, a good business model because we would like to choose the best hospital with high level of accreditation, either Malaysian accreditation or global accreditation, with good brand names that we can promote and to create trust and build confidence for people to come and travel. So these are good hospitals that have good track records and they themselves have appetite to open up their business to foreign patients. We have foreseen this, the government has foreseen that our private healthcare have excess supply of services that they can open to foreign patients, not just for Malaysian patients. So this is where the room is available for us to expand this market globally, rather than just focus on domestic uh, patients in order to become one of the source of revenue for the country. So we have been working with this private hospital very closely. This also as an, uh, as an avenue for us to reduce the burden of public healthcare system in Malaysia so that any foreign patient who are in Malaysia can focus towards the private hospital. Next slide, just to show very quickly our unique selling proposition in Malaysia, comparatively with other uh, competitive countries in the world, we have high, world high class uh, quality services uh, uh, from our private hospital. This is very well documented because uh, every private hospital is subject to very high level of accreditation and also certification. And before they become our member, they have shown some proof that they have been certified at least with one or two international accreditation, uh, medical accreditation uh, certificate. And also affordability, definitely, we are very competitive in terms of price. The government have a regulation to cap uh, the pricing of services at medical uh, private hospital that makes our services at least 60 to 80 percent more cheaper when we compare to other developed countries. This is also an attraction for people to come to Malaysia. And finally, is ease of accessibility. There are many uh, with our waiting time to, to to get any medical treatment in Malaysia is almost zero in terms of uh, availability, uh, so that they can come here. There are many choices of hospital that provide many critical illness services and they don't have to wait in terms of uh, services to be provided to them. So all of this unique selling, selling proposition is also coupled with the nature of Malaysia as a tourism, tourism destination. So we understand that Malaysia is a very warm country, it's a tourist heaven, 
we have a good transportation hub and the people are very hospitable and of course for the middle eastern country we are also being looked at as a good halal destination for them to come here which better suit the need of their family members so next this is where we look at how we build a seamless experience to create the peace of mind of the patient we mhtc coordinated well with many stakeholders to bring this patient's experience to the, uh, uh, to the fullest extent if you can see uh, the patient that we, we we take care of the patient even before they come to Malaysia. We have a call center, we have a representative office in certain market to ensure that they understand what they are getting into when they come into Malaysia. While they are arriving in at the airport, we have a meet and greet uh, personnel based at all the airports in Malaysia to handle them and to take them to the hospital. And then the hospital will undertake all their patients, uh, all their medical treatment and, and services. And before they leave, they do have option for rehabilitation, recovery, mental health, and even visit Malaysia as a tourism, leisure tourism destination. And when they depart, depart uh, to their respective country, we will follow up sometimes with post-recovery processes as well. So the patient's journey is well taken care of throughout this ecosystem. And this will create a good and very high confidence level for them to come back to Malaysia or even to become our advocate within their respective country later on. Moving to the next slide, this is something very uh, that I'm very proud to show that uh, with all those services and, and with all those uh, facilities that MHTC have garnered to ensure patient uh, great experience when they are in Malaysia, you can see based on uh, Lang Boyzon Medical Travel and, to, and Tourism Global Market Report, we have been uh, designated as the top among the top medical tourism destination in 2018. And Malaysia has also been receiving several accolades from international market, international medical travel journal, and international uh, living global retirement index that give us some recognition and also give us uh, some uh, a level of confidence in terms of promoting Malaysia globally. Next slide. So now we are moving towards the period of. Uh, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. How, what, what happened right now in our situation is quite devastating. As rightly mentioned by this, uh, Professor Timothy just now, uh, immediately when border is closed, traveling across border is almost non-existent, uh, especially for tourism travel. They say that uh, it's very uh, well known that tourism sector is the first to be hit and probably will be the last to recover because leisure travel is always an optional. Uh, but for us in the medical in the medical travel, uh, medical travel is also sometimes a necessity. So there is a room for us to 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 have some movement of people. So what we did was uh, we we noticed that almost eighty percent or more than eighty percent uh, restriction have been put uh, within the international travel pattern. And then what we have to do is now moving towards digitalization to ensure continuity of care. Because within the medical traveler or medical tourism services, we understand that some critical patients need a continuity of care within the hospital that we have in Malaysia. We need to provide that channel. We quickly move towards digitalization, linking ourselves with our potential uh, patients across the border and always continue the care as at least to the, to the extent that we can maintain communication with them. And throughout that, that process, we are also looking at building, at that time, a standard operating procedure or protocol to allow foreign patients to come into Malaysia. So I will share this a bit more detail later on. Next slide, our plan was to look at, especially in terms of three phases of recovery and three phases of uh, rebuilding and growth. Uh, as rightfully said by the previous speaker, we have a recovery phase that we are looking at to keep our consumer interested with Malaysia as a brand, as a destination. Uh, we take this time as well to consolidate our stakeholder to further tighten the ecosystem where the patient will travel in, within Malaysia so that they can have an unforgettable experience in Malaysia. And we are also looking at digitalization or digital framework and on how to improve further or or. Uh, adapt to the new normal of patients' experience in Malaysia. Area where they don't have to do, they, they can adapt to touchless processing, we want to adapt that. Area where they can have uh, a, a shorter time, waiting time within the hospital or at the airport and, and so on and so forth through digitalization, we want to implement that. So this is the time that we take to build this uh, in, a, in a stronger way. 
And then moving to rebuild phase, we are looking at how to build a safe and trusted destination. So this is now we are moving towards, as mentioned just now, recovery marketing. We want to push and we want to be ready for them to come in. And finally, the growth stage. The growth stage is that we want to look at new potential market. We want to have a new branding for Malaysia. Uh, and we want to focus on specific treatment that is of strength to Malaysia, for example, cardiology, oncology, and fertility. So these are some of the plans that we have put in place in order to move forward uh, beyond COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, just to give a taste to the audience, some of the suspended marketing as mentioned just now, we are doing right now, we are staying warm. We want to keep our brand uh, within the, the mind of all the potential global patients around the world. So we are having a branding campaign, which is Malaysia World Healthcare Marvel. And at the same time, we also want to showcase uh, the, the domestic effort that being undertaken by Malaysia. So we have a publication of 100 unsung heroes to showcase the life and experience of our frontline. And now we are also looking at a campaign on uh, that, that uh, a campaign on the end starts with you, which is a campaign for Malaysia to stop the spread of COVID-19 so that we can showcase to the world that and ensure then that this week Malaysia is a trusted destination and well-coordinated effort have been taken in terms of uh, fighting the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, at the same time, we do our outreach through virtual media consultation and health talk with various destinations or various markets uh, across the country just to keep our brand warm within their mind internationally. And next is something that we are very proud of. Uh, I, I believe that our border was closed in March in 2020 last year. But off the bat, very quickly, Malaysia Healthcare Travel Council garner the confidence and, and try to negotiate with the National Security Council quickly to establish a travel bubble for medical travelers only. This is very difficult to do because there was no other travel bubble that being uh, established at that moment. But fortunately, uh, the central government agency had full trust on Malaysia healthcare travel and they allow us to bring in foreign patients for continuity of care with some very strict protocols to bring them in. So this is a very good best practice or example that has been implemented until today with great success. And we have brought in several patients from across the border and they have gone through the treatment, high value treatment, critical treatment, and the services have made, have been delivered very full, uh, very satisfactory satisfactorily for our patients. So this is one of the key achievement that we have established. Uh, and of course, the the travel medical travel bubble is now being expanded. Um, but we have to wait for a while until the numbers goes down. When the numbers of infection goes down, we want to expand this travel bubble to allow a bit more relaxation in terms of the protocol for bringing in people. But for now. I have to stress this very carefully. The, the protocol is being handled very strictly to ensure the safety of the patients, uh, but more so also to ensure the safety of the Malaysian citizens. So the protocol is being approved, but being handled very carefully by the Malaysian Healthcare Travel Council. And the next slide will show where we are heading right now. So as you can see, the number of healthcare travelers uh, coming into Malaysia, but this is in terms of revenue that we receive. The number of revenue that we receive have dropped by 53% in the year 2020, and we expect it to drop further in the year 2021 because the border remains closed. Although we have the protocol to bring in patients, but the number is quite minimal. Uh, but we are expecting a recovery process of more than almost 40% uh, growth rate for the next four years. So we are looking forward with a uh, a very strategic marketing plan to promote Malaysia as a destination with full trust and confidence for the patients to come, come again to Malaysia. Moving to my final slide. So this is what uh, our aspiration is all about. We want uh, all Malaysians to understand uh, the, the context of Malaysia as a healthcare destination, whereby we want to bring in patients from abroad and we also want to be an advocate for local foreign patients to also seek treatment within Malaysia. So we want Malaysia to be an advocate and ambassador for, for Malaysia to promote Malaysia, Malaysia as a healthcare destination. But more importantly is what Malaysian we ourselves have to do right now. You are rightfully said just now, Dr. Johan, the numbers is quite high in Malaysia, but every one of us has a, has a responsibility uh, to flatten the curve together. And number two is vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. 
this is the key. Everybody has to go for this. Please sign up. Please wait for your turn. And once we have this, reached that herd immunity, there's a lot more possibility that we can go through uh, and we can, uh, it's open to us in terms of receiving patients abroad. And finally, we only should open our border when it is safe. Uh, one of the key things I want to end my presentation with is that where do we go from here? This is something is very important. We are now in this pandemic. We have learned a lot from this pandemic. This is our first time going through this. But what about future reoccurrence? So we need to think of that very carefully. Uh, future reoccurrence, you can bet that many countries, if they are not ready, they will immediately stop or close their border immediately, even faster than this pandemic back uh, in March last year. So do we want to go to that route whereby the economic uh, devastation will be even more severe if they close the border immediately or do we want to prepare ourselves when the new or, or, or future pandemic occurs again do we still want to go through that route of closing the border or do we want to prepare ourselves with the proper protocol uh, in balancing life and livelihood while managing uh, future reoccurrence of such pandemic in the future so that's what we are learning right now uh, we are happy that when this happened Medical tourists or medical travelers can still travel with our standard operating procedure, our travel protocol. So that has lessened the disruption of services that we can provide for international patients. So we hope that this can be replicated in many other sectors, including business, including travel, leisure travel, and so on and so forth, so that we are ready for future, possible future reoccurrence of similar pandemic. With that, I, I end my presentation now. Uh, I, I am very happy to be here and I'm, I'm ready to uh, entertain any questions that you have. Inshallah. Thank you, Mr. Daud, uh, for your uh, very, uh, uh, what I call, in-depth insights. Okay, uh, I have a question uh, to you, Mr. Daud. Uh, it's regarding the, as you uh, we see from every day from the news, from the statistics that we have looked into uh, every day since like yesterday is the highest numbers of the COVID-19 cases when there's numbers of uh, what are called uh, testing, swap testing all over uh, Klang Valley. All right. So what is the role? I think I, I believe you are uh, you are I mean, in the in the uh, group of people who basically will be able to answer this question. How about uh, what is your comment on the private uh, hospital involvement in tackling COVID cases in Malaysia? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. So in terms of private hospital, we're working very closely with them. First and foremost, uh, they are very much willing to be and advocate in terms of establish, establish, establishing a vaccination center across the across Malaysia. So they are open for that and they want to be among the center for vaccination so that the rollout of the vaccination can be fast. Uh, and also many of the hospitals work with us in terms of campaign to uh, social distancing, wearing masks and so on and so forth. Uh, and in terms of testing, of course, many of the private hospitals are covering for foreign patients here in Malaysia to ensure that they undertake their uh, COVID testing on a regular basis. So these are some of the things that the private hospital is doing with us. But more importantly right now is that they are ready to be a center of vaccination and they are also ready to be a center of vaccination for those who are willing to buy and pay for vaccination in the future. But of course right now the priority of, for the general Malaysian who really want to go for vaccination. We want that to move forward first and private hospitals are within this process. But later on, when we have reached herd immunity, we can move towards opening it up to other patients who can afford to pay for this vaccination in the future. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daud. So I have a question here uh, from Arsla, uh, Arslan Ali, uh, our participant today. How can healthcare providers seize opportunities in attracting foreign patients during the growing globalization of healthcare? What marketing strategies can help providers engage in to attract medical tourists? Okay, uh, it's a general question. It depends on which time period we are. So let me just give some, some indication right now. So uh, first and foremost, right now, during uh, I would say recovery and rebuild phase, uh, we are focusing on our major market right now. Uh, the major market, which is Indonesia, India, and also China. So this major market, we are directly doing some promotional webinar and, and so on and so forth to receive patients in a very strict and very, I would say, controlled manner through our SOP. But beyond that, uh, as, as mentioned just now, we need to keep our branding 
warm globally. So this is where we keep on saying that Malaysia is here. Malaysia is still uh, promoting uh, strict and 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 very safe protocol within Malaysia. Although the number doesn't doesn't really help at the moment, but that's the the message that we want to put out there. And then at the same time, we are also looking at new potential market that we want to expand beyond our traditional market right now. But the priority is now to rebound and bring back our traditional market patients into Malaysia once the border fully open. And then during this time, we have identified a few other new market, but we are not venturing or doing hard sell into the new market right now. I give you some potential new market, which is the Middle East. Uh, we are looking at Russia. We are also looking at uh, in the Northeast Asia market as well. But right now, we are not moving hard selling into the new market yet. So we want to bring confidence back to the traditional market because some of the changing in behavior of the patient within those countries have changed. They might be more comfortable and willing to seek treatment within their own country during this con uh, pandemic time, which will hinder them or demotivate them to travel to Malaysia in the future when the border opens. So immediately, the focus is to bring back traditional patient, traditional market back into Malaysia. But in the medium term, we are looking at new market that we want to establish. Thank you, Mr. Daud. I have uh, one last question for you, Mr. Daud. I believe from your experience uh, in this medical care, um, my question is just uh, maybe you would like to uh, explain a bit. How are we going to tackle? I think uh, lots of people have these questions all over Malaysia, especially right. the Malaysian citizen, regarding the how are we going to reduce the number of COVID-19 uh, strategies that is one of the most important strategies that we need to do in order for us to reduce the number of cases that is actually now is coming like increasing every day. Yep. Right. Mr. Daud, please. Bullet. So, so okay, <laughs> this, this, is, this is something that I've touched on my final slide just now. Uh, there's no no way no way around it. Uh, I believe what we have in Malaysia is the syndrome whereby uh, we are moving towards uh, uh, we, we have been too complacent with the current situation uh, whereby we, we try to dilute our awareness or dilute our willingness to, to do those specific things uh, such as wearing our mask, double masking, wash our hand, use sanitizer, social distancing, uh, and people are still traveling even though there is specific guideline that's trying to tell us to, to not do so. So, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a collective responsibility of us to ensure this, number one. Number two, we cannot run away. We, it has to be a vaccination process. Vaccination process will allow us to treat this pandemic at the end of the day to become an endemic process what, as what Singapore is doing right yes, now. Yes, yeah, Singapore is doing right now. Yeah. That process. So, uh, we are working towards achieving that herd immunity. Uh, these are the two things that I can see to be very effective right now. So we need to move towards this 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 particular objective in very immediately, I would say. All right. Thank you, Mr. Daud, for your, uh, what I, call, I can say, beautiful explanation about what is going on right now. And of course, the uh, the um, uh, healthcare uh, in Malaysia. So thank you very much, Mr. Daud, for your uh, sessions, uh, for your presentations. And uh, we would like, uh, uh, Najmi, uh, are we going to take a picture or maybe this is later on? Najmi, this is later on, right? Take picture with Mr. Daud or we move to another speaker. So I believe we move, move to another speaker, yeah? All right, yeah. so uh, thank you, Mr. Daud, uh, for, for your I mean, uh, in-depth explanation about what is going on right now for the pandemic COVID-19 and of course the Malaysian uh, healthcare system that we have here uh, privately, yeah? Next, we have our... Third speaker, that is Professor Dharma Putra from the Udayana University, Bali. Okay, just a bit uh, brief about uh, uh, Professor Ainyoman Dharma Putra. Uh, professor Ainyoman Dharma Putra is a professor at the Faculty of Human Humanities, Udayana University, Bali. He completed his doctoral degree at the University of Queensland, I believe. Uh, I was doing my master's uh, when uh, in 2003. I finished 2003. Masters at the University of Queensland, so meaning should be alumni, Prof. Yeah. In 2014, 2017, he was had the Masters Program in Tourism Studies and Postgraduate Program. Since 2010, Prof. Dharma Putra has been the Editor-in-Chief of the Bali Studies Journal, accredited by Sinta II. Um, uh, in 2019, Prof. Dharma Putra has become the International Advisory Board of the Journals of Indonesia and the Malay World. 
indexed by scholars YouTube. This research interest focus on literature and culture and tourism. All right, before we proceed with Prof. Dharma, uh, I would like to 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 to, uh, to to read here the topic that is going to be covered by uh, Professor Dharma. That is hospitality and tourism industry post COVID 19 pandemic reformation. Without uh, further ado, I would like to call upon Prof. Dharma to his presentation. Please. And thank you very much for Mr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Johan Udin, Associate Professor Johan Udin, being uh, the chairman of our program uh, this afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Associate Professor Ajila Asmi for inviting me to share to uh, this uh, very important uh, webinar. Uh, today, I will uh, talk about the uh, lesson that Bali has taken during the COVID-19 pandemic and then how they will use it uh, when hopefully the uh, pandemic uh, come uh, to an end. But before that, I would like to uh, put the outline of my presentation. Uh, after the introduction, I would like to uh, discuss a bit about Bali tourism uh, from crisis to crisis. A uh, lot of things has been discussed about Bali tourism from the cultural uh, uh, astronomy point of view during the golden age of tourism, but now uh, probably a time for us uh, to talk about the uh, the, the other aspect, the dark side of uh, tourism in Bali from crisis to crisis. And then uh, before uh, offer a discussion, I will outline some lesson that uh, Bali taken during the COVID-19. Uh, this is the map of Bali for those who, who haven't been to Bali. Uh, Bali is a very small island located in the middle of the archipelago, only perhaps two uh, and a half hour uh, to Singapore or two and a half hour to uh, Earth or, or, or another, you know, very close. And that's why our main market are nearby countries, including Malaysia, of course, Singapore and, and Australia. And uh, if, we, if we talk about the Bali tourism from crisis to crisis, everyone probably uh, remember how Bali was attacked by uh, terrorists in 2002, followed by a SAR that uh, uh, engulf uh, almost part of the world, and then also again the Bali bombings in 2005. Those uh, tragedy, of course, uh, gave a big impact to Bali tourism. But uh, we look uh, uh, what happened after that. That was the the recovery process was going very quick, uh, almost out of uh, people uh, imagination. Because I remember at that time people were, were were talking about, well, this is the end of Bali tourism, but in fact, the recovery program uh, picked up very quickly. Uh, apart from the Bali bombing, there were also natural disasters, such as eruption and Lombok, the uh, neighboring island of Bali, uh, Sulawesi earthquake. Uh, there were there were other islands, uh, but also get impact to uh, our uh, tourism industry in Bali. The third is the Mount Hagong eruption, caused airport close for two and a half days, and also in, in, in the following years for another day which has caused, of course, the nil arrival during the, the closing. And then now we experience a COVID-19 pandemic, which gives a severe impact to uh, Bali tourism. So uh, the Bali uh, has struggled a lot from uh, time to time, trying to cope with the crisis that they experienced uh, so far. Uh, this is the pictures of Mount Agung. During those times, a lot of uh, tourists cannot uh, went out because the uh, airport was closed. But uh, like a blessing in disguise, they can uh, enjoy the, the, the beautiful uh, uh, nature where they can uh, swim and watch the uh, beautiful of the uh, Mount Nago. Of course, this is a very dangerous uh, thing to do, but uh, they did so. And luckily, luckily that the uh, eruption uh, didn't uh, last long, uh, but uh, occur uh, incidentally uh, after time to time, although uh, the impact is not as great as the uh, to, in 2017. And if you look at the the, uh, the crisis that Bali tourism faced, uh, and compared to the number of arrival, uh, if uh, we look to the, the 2003 arrival, it's dropped below one billion. Uh, this is certainly caused by the Bali bombing, and then pick up quickly, as I uh, mentioned before. The recovery process was very quick because uh, Bali helped support from almost uh, every corner of the world in terms of marketing and also security in place. 
And although the second bombing in 2005 uh, occurred again, right, the, the arrival number uh, won't, uh, didn't give much impact to the uh, arrival number. And straight from the 2006 to 2018, uh, Bali received uh, almost one, uh, just over one, uh, six million uh, foreign tourists uh, arrival to Bali uh, directly. It didn't include the number that uh, came to Bali from uh, other airports like Jakarta, Medan, uh, Manado, and, and, and elsewhere. This is only those who arrive directly uh, to Bali. And the contribution of Bali tourism to the national uh, tourism uh, until 2018, Bali contributed to 38% uh, uh, of the number of international uh, arrival. This is this is very important to uh, show to you because uh, during the pandemic, government uh, gap, uh, has given a very uh, serious attention uh, they spoil Bali in order to uh, uh, make possible uh, tourism can uh, pick up quickly because once Bali tourism pick up, then uh, economy of other uh, region in Indonesia uh, could also help. Uh, this is uh, because of the contribution of Bali to national uh, tourism uh, has been very, uh, very high. And in terms of economic growth, uh, I got this from, uh, from uh, Bank Indonesia. I'm not an economist. I just use this and read this as you can see that the uh, economic group of Bali, the growth of Bali, uh, usually uh, above of the national, uh, national growth which is something on the contrary when the pandemic uh, attack all, uh, all of us. And, and uh, the other thing that I need to mention also that the central government uh, in Jakarta has a uh, prioritizing uh, tourism in Indonesia because uh, our government has, has always mentioned that they have prioritization, but in reality, they almost uh, done very little. But the current president, uh, since he came to power in 2019, uh, 14, 2014, uh, he put a lot of uh, breakthrough in order to increase because uh, he <clears throat> was ashamed to see the statistic of the arrival number, at least as an indicator of the arrival number into a Southeast Asian country. Thailand was 38 million in 2018, Malaysia 25 million, but Indonesia considered as the, the, the biggest country uh, by geography, only received uh, 15.8 uh, million, far below than uh, Singapore. So based on this uh, figure, then the government tried to push uh, strongly to uh, develop uh, uh, tourism in Indonesia, among other things to to create uh, what they call it uh, 10 new Bali, uh, to create another Bali uh, elsewhere, uh, and also uh, later on to give a super uh, priority uh, tourism destination in five uh, destinations, including uh, Borobudur Heritage and also the, the Komodo Island, the, the Dragon Island in the uh, East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, uh, this has also become a, a big reflection for uh, our government because the competitiveness index of Indonesian tourism uh, only placed on the 40th uh, out of 140 countries, which is very low compared to uh, the rank of the uh, our uh, neighboring country in uh, South Asia. And uh, when all the priority was given by the government, then we know that the pandemic struck us all uh, around the world, and then the the the, the the all the program were like stand still very very hard to uh, continue whatever effort has been done which has always uh, always follow the situation uh, the up and down of the uh, infected number the up and down on the the, the arrival of new variant strain of virus uh, all uh, uh, influence the uh, attempt to uh, uh, to re to recover uh, tourism this is the figure that uh, in 2019 uh, uh, 2020, I mean, there was news on the Bali's mystery immunity to COVID-19. Uh, everyone uh, seemed to think that Bali uh, is a magic island, uh, it has a certain immunity, but in fact, if you look at the number, the number says something different. Uh, we are not really a immunity from uh, the virus. The number uh, continue to increase. Just uh, the, the uh, uh, yesterday number, the 8th of July, uh, we got a uh, 577 increased uh, infected uh, 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 coronavirus just in the small island uh, of Bali. This is very, uh, very high number. And the government uh, put the uh, lockdown uh, emergency 
for Japan and Bali, although a lot of people in Bali uh, didn't like to, uh, to accept this, but uh, the strong measure put by government, uh, the data that uh, convinced the people, then we have no other choice to, to accept this. If we look at the number of the, the infected uh, by day and the possibility of reopen, the idea to reopen Bali, uh, Bali need to, to, to minimize the number of infected uh, into 100 or below. Uh, and this is very hard from 500 to, uh, to 100, but who knows, uh, we, we don't know. And the uh, economic uh, impact to uh, Bali, uh, especially from tourism uh, point of view, uh, certainly seen uh, shown by this uh, data. In uh, 2019, uh, there were 5.8 uh, uh, million uh, tourist arrival internationally, but this dropped into 1.2. So the uh, growth was minus uh, 79 or almost uh, 80 percent, which is a, a big drop. Uh, likewise, also the domestic arrival from 4.1 into only 1.3, uh, minus uh, almost. 67 uh, percent. In terms of economy, as we saw just then, the economic growth of Bali generally above the uh, national economic growth, but uh, the uh, high uh, dependence of Bali into tourism economy. And when tourism uh, stuck or stop, uh, the impact then certainly uh, uh, subsequently high too. And the uh, the third uh, 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 year. Uh, in 2020, the economic group minus almost 13 uh, 13 percent. Uh, this is the direct uh, relationship between the high dependence on tourism. When I look into the number of the uh, impacts of pandemic in terms of the local economy into the Komodo Island, the island uh, uh, in the his uh, Tenggara, uh, their uh, um, minus was less than one percent. So they still has other source of economy to. Uh, support the, their economic, but Bali uh, uh, highly rely on tourism. And <clears throat> to summarize the impact of the uh, uh, pandemic, this is the, of course temporarily. Then uh, the data changes by time, by day, perhaps also by minute. Uh, by minutes during the pandemic, Bali lost, they said, nine trillion per month. Uh, this is nine trillion rupiah Indonesian uh, currency, and more than one hundred thousand tourism worker. And related to that, uh, probably more uh, became jobless. They they, they, they cannot uh, now run their car to pick up tourists from the airport. They cannot take tourists to, to, to travel around in Bali. And as I said before, the Bali's economic growth was minus uh, 12.28, the third quarter of 20, the third quarter of national figure uh, was minus only uh, less than four. So the, 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 the gap is very high. And misery continues following the second lockdown. So that was the first lockdown, and now it's the second lockdown. But we in Indonesia use our local language to say lockdown. Lockdown is not used, but uh, people are more familiar to use this uh, terminology. And this is the report from the, the slide time. It said that Bali's second lockdown, misery just as re reopening uh, was inside because <clears throat> the the other impacts of the uh, uh, pandemic also uh, uh, fell by monkey in the uh, very popular monkey forest uh, tourist attraction in Ubud in the uh, south central of Bali. And I got from the newspaper that the uh, management of the monkey forest uh, it cost four million a day uh, for month to, to feed up the monkey. Uh, they feed them with the cassava, uh, 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 popo or papaya and other type of food that, uh, that they already uh, know what best for them uh, under, uh, after a consultation with the veterinarian. So uh, there are a number of monkey forests in Bali and they also suffer from uh, spotting themselves in order to uh, keep the monkey healthy. Uh, in the normal day, this monkey forest could earn, uh, depending on the uh, high season and low season, almost 200 million rupiah, uh, 200 uh, million rupiah per day, uh, probably higher than the most uh, ben, uh, of profit put on by uh, Star Hotel. Uh, this is very popular because it's located in the tourism track uh, close by uh, Ubud uh, destination. 
And uh, let me do a break a little bit. This is a short clip how the international media, especially Australian News Broadcasting Corporation, uh, uh, report what happened in our island. I hope the audio is, uh, is uh, could be uh, heard well. The waters in Bali's north are a popular dive site for European tourists, but a year after tourism was banned, the beaches are almost deserted. Hotels and restaurants are struggling to stay afloat. Across Bali, countless hotels and villas are for sale, many because the pandemic has decimated their businesses. Indonesia is now looking at ways to allow foreign tourists back to Bali if they've been vaccinated or test negative on arrival. The plan is for a COVID-free corridor with individual cities, ideally some of them in Australia. I don't know where I know first. Based on big data, it's, it should be Perth because Perth is the uh, the ones with the most um, tourists, incoming tourists. Tourists could only visit designated areas such as Nusa Dua in Bali South, where the local population would be vaccinated in advance. The country's tourism minister has discussed the idea with Australia's ambassador, although not yet with the government in Canberra but he's hopeful a COVID-free bubble could revive Bali's devastated economy. I've heard a request of opening up this uh, corridor by end of March uh, or early April. Let's see. I don't want to give any false hope. The plan would also include funds. I think uh, that uh, should be enough on the uh, what happened to the uh, tourism industry, some uh, hotel uh, then uh, on, on sale, they cannot survive the pandemic because it's just just like an unended uh, uh, crisis uh, already one and a half years from now. Government, government very try hard to uh, put back the tourism industry from, from Bali and beyond by uh, doing uh, uh, other things that they never done it before. For example, the campaign of the Clean Liners Health, Safety and Environmental Sustainability in brief is called CSHE uh, in order to ensure the, uh, the uh, visitor, if they come to hotel, uh, that they, the visitor feel uh, very safe, something that already mentioned in, uh, in the uh, Professor uh, Dallin uh, presentation, how important uh, for the industry uh, to make their guests uh, safe. Uh, and having good uh, experience. Apart from that, government also uh, grant a tax return to eligible tourism company in Bali, something that they've done before, uh, because uh, in the past, during the golden age of uh, tourism, uh, tourism company are uh, the main source of the uh, local and central government uh, tax income. Uh, now they, they do it uh, by doing the tax return. Uh, the industry also put the uh, initiative to try to market uh, uh, the their property by putting by now safe letter, uh, staycation or a vacation. And now if you come to Bali or if you ask the local people in Bali, uh, so some of them uh, who uh, belong to the half or the upper middle and upper class, they are trying to, uh, to stay in a number of uh, star hotels. Uh, because uh, the Sarah Hotel put their price uh, way below proper normal price. It probably one third. Uh, like this one, they put uh, 750,000 uh, for two days. It's normally 1 million for only one day during the uh, uh, era of tourism. Uh, community also do their initiative in order to, to maintain the spirit of uh, uh, the tourism and also to support their uh, living. Uh, they do a virtual tourism. Although this is not a solution, for the uh, COVID-19, but they're doing that uh, to maintain that they are there, uh, they are promote to other uh, uh, potential customer uh, to put their uh, product in the mind of customer. Who knows when the pandemic uh, come into the end, they become the first to, uh, to choose. Some of them also return to agriculture. And apart from that, government also uh, uh, introduced what they call it, uh, uh, work from home to copy the uh, popular uh, uh, phrase of work from home uh, to become work from Bali, uh, promoting Bali as an ideal home uh, for digital nomad uh, tourists. And if uh, foreigner work in Bali and in Bali or in Indonesia, and, uh, they can uh, uh, they can receive a free tax as far as they don't earn money from the Indonesia. If they earn from elsewhere, uh, they, they don't become a tax target. Uh, 
Indonesia Care, Willow Bali, it's, uh, it's a real uh, action uh, to promote uh, CHSE uh, because uh, as a program, uh, government uh, need to ensure that the people, uh, customer, uh, 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 management uh, understand and really uh, put them into uh, practice. Uh, government uh, give a free uh, travel prior uh, to a millennial group. Uh, with the condition that as long as they have minimum uh, 2,000 followers in Instagram, they can apply. Of course, the, those uh, who then uh, selected were based on the highest. The highest you have, the more chance you have. So they were taken everywhere uh, to, 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 to send the message that uh, living with COVID travel uh, still can be uh, an, an enjoyable things to do as far as the uh, protocol uh, health protocol uh, in place uh, uh, closely. Uh, apart from that, not only targeting uh, uh, digital nomad tourists, uh, government also uh, promoting uh, work from Bali. So uh, before the second lockdown, the government has decided um, to ask a seven, uh, seven uh, ministerial office in Jakarta to send 25% of their staff uh, to work from Bali. For the some work from Jakarta, other work from Bali. And uh, Minister of Tourism has done that uh, uh, two or three months earlier. So uh, they work from Bali, uh, they, they check everything on related to tourism, but they also do other things uh, from Bali. So work from Bali or work from Jakarta in the digital uh, era is doesn't make uh, much different. But there were also a question, uh, how to focus on work without wanting to take a holiday. If you were in Bali, uh, your spirit uh, that the critics I, uh, the critics I probably lose uh, there and 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 so forth. And apart from that, the uh, government also uh, do a mass vaccination program in Bali uh, to make uh, three uh, three green zone area in the Nusa Dua in the south, uh, in Sanur uh, in the middle, and also in Ubud, the village that I just mentioned before. And Jokowi went to Ubud. Uh, she was greeted by. A, a, a beautiful Bali stand, and and this area uh, are expected to become green zones, ready uh, to receive uh, tourists. But that's not always uh, uh, things uh, can uh, uh, occur as planned because uh, uh, they all depend on the uh, situation with the COVID. And uh, the good news was uh, spread around, and this is really almost occurred. When Singapore Airlines uh, direct flight uh, tried to take uh, uh, service from uh, from Singapore to Bali uh, from Fort uh, of May, so uh, every system, airport, staff, everything uh, has been organized in welcome uh, the new uh, form of tourism bubble between uh, Bali and Singapore. But uh, as we see, the travel bubble uh, create a trouble because the uh, pandemic uh, case uh, has increased in India and in Singapore Island postponed plan to, uh, to open direct. So a lot of uh, attempts has been done, but what happened in reality always uh, depend on things. And this is why uh, watching the development of tourism everywhere, the United uh, Nations World Tourism Organization, Sarah Polili Kaushvili said that now as we want to restart tourism, we must recognize that restriction are just one part of the solution. So we cannot ignore the tourism, uh, the, 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 the restriction. If we open uh, things and, and things probably fall apart uh, and it's better to put restriction in order to keep uh, tourism uh, developed slowly. And uh, this is what the, uh, our minister say, we will be waiting for the situation to be more conducive. Although talk has been done uh, to the Australian ambassador in Jakarta, Things all depend on uh, what happened. Bali tried to uh, uh, reach the target to get 70% of the people uh, vaccinated. Uh, so far, uh, we got only 70% uh, uh, from the 70% uh, target. So still uh, some way to go, but the preparation is uh, going there. Uh, hotel property on sale, as mentioned in the news before, I don't want to repeat that. This is the last uh, part of my presentation. Lesson from pandemic. I, I take note after talking to uh, several uh, general manager of hotel in Bali, uh, they generally give this uh, give this uh, five of lesson. Probably there are more other, but uh, uh, five could be easily uh, cover most of the thing. One attitude toward hygiene is not negotiable, so everyone has to adjust their service uh, 
hospitality uh, uh, with uh, in accordance with that hygiene, uh, something that perhaps not uh, surely uh, attended uh, before. And when the uh, customer believe in uh, your service, uh, then become a trust. And trust is a new mantra. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to spend a lot of money to promote. They will promote it. So trust is has become uh, a new mantra that uh, spell out by the customer uh, on social media that they will invite uh, to come to your uh, property, to come to your place. This is a point of digital amenities, something that I mentioned by Professor Dahlen. Uh, Dahlen. Uh, and uh, now we can see the practice that how the contact become very less between customer and, and waiter and waitress. So we come to a restaurant, all the menu, uh, check-in process are done uh, via online, uh, so less contact uh, become very important because of the technology. Empathy is a new currency, so we have, uh, uh, they say that the uh, hotel uh, management has to really uh, pay attention uh, uh, specifically uh, to their customer because something uh, could happen during this crisis, so uh, uh, this we, we cannot be uh, very strict to the to the cancellation, one cannot very straight to the extension lay lay down to stay outside of the checkout time and things like that. Once you give that empathy, it becomes also trust, and that means you create a new mantra. And the last one is survival is a is a new is a new profit in this kind of crisis. They say they told me that they they everyone want to have a profit every time, every second more than they that they can have. But in the, the time of crisis, uh, become become standstill is already a new profit. So you don't have to to, to sell your property. Uh, you can maintain things. Uh, you can employ people, probably ten or twenty percent. Uh, as long as you survive, uh, that is a form of profit. This uh, lesson uh, from pandemic uh, uh, exercised by uh, Balinese. Uh, uh, in tourism industry in Bali, then I'm sure that having this one and that they always spread it out among their uh, professional networking, uh, we believe that the uh, industry could uh, survive uh, uh, as long as the pandemic COVID uh, and very soon. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I uh, give back the time to moderator. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you uh, Prof. Uh, thank you, Prof. Dharma, for uh, a very uh, in-depth uh, presentation uh, about Bali. All right, I have a question uh, for you, uh, Prof. Uh, Dharma. It's regarding the. Uh, it's unlike the uh, the, the uh, situation in Phuket. What 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 we, what we can learn from Phuket that actually they are opening the uh, island for to tourists. Uh, I would like to read some. Coming travelers, the island are now being rapidly vaccinated. As Tuesday, 45.3% uh, received a second dose, and Anda are being asked to strictly follow precaution. So, uh, how do you see the situation like uh, in Phuket uh, towards Bali? Rob? I think the uh, step taken by most of the government now is to uh, uh, vaccinate the people uh, as much as they can. The theory said that uh, we have to have 70% 70, 70 of the total population. And if we can uh, have more, uh, of course, uh, it's better. And I think what Phuket have done is similar also to uh, what happened in, in Bali. But Indonesia is a big country. Uh, so far, as I mentioned before, our uh, central government give a lot of priority uh, into Balinese people. Uh, uh, specifically, the program of, uh, uh, of creating uh, three uh, green zone of Nusa Dua, the uh, upper level uh, resort market in the south, in Sanur, uh, more middle and, and lower, and Ubud more culture and nature likely. So the government tries to uh, do a mass vaccination uh, in those three areas. For example, in the Nusa Dua era, uh, they did it what we call it a drive through uh, vaccination. So the driver uh, transport, the goja, the grab driver and thing. Uh, they don't need to uh, booking, they just come there, uh, put their ID card, and then they will get vaccination. The more uh, number of the people that are vaccinated, uh, and we hope that the number of uh, infected uh, can 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 uh, decrease, and uh, the more uh, 
diplomatic and negotiation to do a bubble travel uh, is possible. But again, everything has been done. New strain virus uh, came around with the number of uh, casualty uh, higher and higher. So this is a, the restart and restart is kind of uh, like dog and cat come after another. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof, for, for your explanation. So we have a, we would like to take a question from the participants today. Uh, we have Nur Ashik and Saleh. Uh, the question is, did Bali is now ready to open border for international tourists and domestic by August? And what other action has been taken in Bali to overcome this pandemic? Yeah, if you look at the number of the infected cases, which is uh, increased uh, by 500, well, um, our minister uh, clearly said that if we got the uh, below 100, then that is only possible to open. So at, at this stage, the situation in Bali is uh, hardly uh, to push the government to uh, open border to other uh, the, to other uh, visitor to come to come into the island. But as uh, the minister also said, uh, they continue to work hard. Uh, who knows? Uh, suddenly, uh, we don't know the uh, attitude of the virus. Uh, the number has dropped down and the negotiation uh, should be uh, opened up again uh, for uh, bubble travel, especially say, with the Singapore or Perth uh, in uh, Western Australia, which is very close. Uh, at this time, uh, not much we can hope, although we know that the suffering of the, uh, the, of the investor, uh, employer, um, very sad, they, some even uh, couldn't buy the registration car, uh, problem with the food and everything. It's very, very difficult uh, because the high dependence of tourism. Yeah, thank you, uh, Prof, uh, for your depth explanation about the situation right now in Bali. Right, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, so uh, now we would like to take like a five minutes break before we proceed with another, another two speaker. So stay back. And after this, we're going to come back. Stay tuned. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Right, so uh, we are going to move to the uh, next uh, presenter that uh, is going to present uh, a topic, a very interesting topic, yeah. Um, before I proceed, I would like to introduce our next speaker is Dr. Daisy Fan. Uh, Dr. Daisy Fan is the principal academic of Bournemouth University Business School. She previously holds the position of senior lecturer in people and organization in the Faculty of Management, Bournemouth University, UK. Her expertise is in tourist behavior, social contact, cultural distance, senior well-being, and cruise travel. She holds a PhD from the Hong Kong Polytechnic um, University. And uh, she is also the assistant editor for Tourism Review and managing editor for the Journal of Quality Assurance in Hospitality and Tourism. All right, before uh, that, uh, the topic that is going to be presented by Dr. Daisy is the preserving the local culture in UK and Europe during COVID-19 pandemic. Without uh, after ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Daisy to present a topic. Please, Dr. Daisy. Hi, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I will try to share my screen now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and share some of my thoughts on this topic. Um, this is a very meaningful platform, actually, uh, I feel, bringing people's uh, scholars, uh, practitioners from different parts of the world and to share their opinions on the same topic, uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic influences on our industry. Um, since my background is about the social and the culture um, aspect of tourism, so my sharing will be around culture and how this kind of, um, has been influenced to different extent, well, from different actors' perspective. Okay. Uh, of course, with the, most of the evidence from um, UK and uh, Europe, and we know that UK have a very different strategy in coping with the COVID-19. And from uh, 19th of July, we're gonna have, um, I think, full release of all those restrictions um, of all those uh, COVID-19 uh, measures. So it's a big challenge and it's very different from other countries. Well, considering uh, we have 90% uh, of the adult having at least first uh, vaccination, um, so this mentality is quite different. They want to, you know, coexist with this uh, um, virus rather than to try to avoid it. So let's see. Nobody knows the result, but it seems very challenging for everyone. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's about the cultures uh, in destinations. So firstly, I would like to um, make like a common platform. So what is culture for us in destinations, in travel? Okay. Um, so here, when we talk about culture in tourism, uh, I think it involves a lot of quite different things. For example, language, customs, um, heritage, of course, and also food. You know, we have a gastronomy, tourism, beliefs, religion, and the most important, I think, behavior we have. And all those different kind of things uh, compose the overall concept of culture, and that's what we have and what we can experience in our tourism. Okay. Well, if we think about culture, you know, it's like a very intangible thing. So how do we understand culture in our travel? So it could be embedded in those heritage. You can see a lot of heritage with culture embedded in it in different European countries. 
we have different culture we can feel or we can interact with the local people uh, from those uh, traditional uh, handcraft or like different workshops. So that also the way we can feel about culture for destination. Definitely, I think we also have a lot of uh, performance dances with a lot of cultural meaning behind. And, you know, for Malaysia, Indonesia, where we have been before, uh, there's a very impressive and a very rich culture behind. Well, I, ha I have to say the British food is not the best, <laughs> of course, for my understanding, but uh, uh, many of the cultures, um, they are integrated in the food or the cuisine for different uh, countries. So yeah, that's different aspect that we could feel and see the cultures in tourism. Well, our next question will be, so how has the pandemic uh, influenced destination culture for us? So we have some direct, uh, direct influence we can see and very similar with other industries like uh, uh, hospitality or some other sectors. Um, less visitation. Okay, um, we are all locked down. We cannot really travel free. So we have less chance to visit those uh, places, especially museums, cultural heritage, and also different uh, sectors. Also pre uh, preservation of the uh, past. A lot of uh, um, like uh, preservation works, they have to stop because people cannot really work at zero because of uh, COVID-19. Let's fund. Maybe from the government, um, they are less fun to support these uh, cultural sectors for them to uh, like to to build up something new or to innovate from the uh, from the foundation, uh, since it is not really the priority right now. And uh, of course, less interactions, especially we mentioned a lot of culture could be uh, learned or built through social interaction, but now it is all suspended. Well, for those listed things, uh, as far as I observe, I feel is quite short term. As long as we have the tourism reopened, those things can be recovered, you know, uh, uh, eventually. But those uh, influence are very heavy for the subculture sector. And as for any other sectors, how you know, has our industry responded? to cope with those changes or those uh, uh, challenges for this uh, sector. Of course, digitization is one of the major tools we could use to, um, re like to reduce the impact from this uh, COVID-19. Okay. For example, there's a lot of uh, museums, they are opening their virtual museums, and um, I don't think I can share the screen for the website, um, this is like for the uh, Natural History Museum London. They have explored different ways to engage with the customers and to let you still um, interact with the culture bit, even though it's online. But they gave a different programs. Some of them are very innovative, uh, like interactive. Some are particularly designed for the kids. You know, they are also locked down at home. They should. They could also learn from those uh, virtual classroom. So some for kids, some for adults, some for other uh, particular interest groups. So this is a well-designed uh, um, website to still engage with the uh, people during this uh, lockdown period. And the travel live streaming is also very useful for the culture sectors to um, still get connected with their customer or potential uh, customers. For example, this is a uh, about the collaboration between uh, Alibaba, uh, uh, Fliggy, this is an online travel agent, and the different cultural organizations in Europe, for example, in France, and also on the uh, right hand side is from the British Museum. They are opening different channels for the live streaming. So those professionals, they are not uh, um, just visitors, they are professionals. They try to show you around uh, in real time and with their professional explanation about different exhibitions, different piece of work. So even though you cannot really go abroad, you can still get a very close touch with those uh, uh, piece of work. And you have very deep understanding of those uh, things. So imagine you physically visit those museum, maybe because of the uh, language barriers or because of the time or the, the availability of the uh, tour guide, 
you may not act immediately about what you, you have in your mind, but here you can type in this uh, chat box, you can ask immediately and there's no barriers. Um, so in this sense, you have a, a, a in-depth understanding of the things in destination. Okay. So that's a two um, very, uh, I think, commonly used approach. Um, those are co uh, cultural sectors in tourism, they try to recover a little bit through this pandemic. When we talk about the culture change or cultural influence from the industry, uh, what about for the local residents or for the local communities? Since that's also one of the very important stakeholders in this tourism uh, uh, industry. So this is one of the examples I found from the local communities um, as about the spirit in UK. Um, during this uh, very challenging time, people tend to express their humanities and uh, engagement a commitment with the public sector and especially with those uh, key workers, what we call key workers. So that means the uh, people in the NHS, the uh, national health services, mainly about the nurses and the doctors. So this is like initiatives, very interesting. Uh, people uh, initiate this uh, uh, campaign. They ask their kids, you know, they're all locked up at home. So they have nothing, you know, really interesting to do. So their parents and the society encourage them to join the rainbow and put these drawings uh, on their window. So uh, outside each of the, the house. Um, so if you drive through, you can see for each of the house, they have a big rainbow outside on their window. And that's what's all drawn for, from the kids. Drawing their hair, their, you know, love and spread this hope during this very difficult time. So when you drive through, you will feel it's very warm. And that's just, you know, from the community part, to show their uh, part of their core uh, spirit in their culture is about humanity. So that's about the residents' participation. Well, from the tourists, we talk about industry from the, the communities, and what about the tourists? And remember we mentioned about those behaviors uh, perceptions, that's all part of culture. So from this perspective, the tourist culture or travel culture uh, could also be influenced by this pandemic. Okay? Um, so if you're thinking about the tourist practice, behaviors and perceptions, I think there are uh, quite a few changes that are noticeable uh, to all of us. For example, uh, if we want to travel right now, maybe we are changing some of our patterns in behavior. For example, better preparation. Before you plan your trip, we need to carefully check about the local regulations. Um, are you in the like safe zone? Um, do you need to have a self-quarantine before and after your trip? That is something we really need to be uh, 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 pay attention to. Also, most people, especially at the early stage, they prefer to have the domestic travel because of the travel restriction. Um, and also technology use, we have everything pre-booked right now since we try to control all those flow and the, the, the amount of the tourists. Um, privacy and the personalization, that might be very important if we want to travel. Uh, we want to make sure we are uh, like staying in a very uh, safe room uh, well, uh, like, uh, with a very good safety guidance behind. And also P2P platform, I will introduce this uh, later on. And uh, trying to be flexible, uh, we have to uh, take all these uh, you know, measures with us, even though you know, uh, the flight could be canceled um, or the, the hotels are not really well um, opened. So what's now our second plan? So that is we need really to uh, pay attention to. Okay. And also responsible behavior. So that is also, I think increase a little bit, especially uh, when you are traveling destination. Okay, we need to be careful. Be, for example, social distancing in the UK is like two meters apart from each other. So we have to be very alert with those kind of rules in mind when traveling. Okay, and also for the perception, I think the the risk perception really increased a lot for the tourist point of view. Um, it's because of this uh, uncertainty and the social, you know, isolation. We are isolated 
for quite a long time. That's really have some mental, mental, you know, uh, influences for everyone. So when we are back to travel, we are meeting people. Do we still have some uncertainties in our mind? Are we really okay to open to all and, you know, we to visit each other, high five and the kiss on the face? That's also different things might influence our perception and behavior. Well, will that be long term or short term? Since the pandemic is still being developed and it's still got ongoing, we cannot really tell uh, from now. But it's uh, for, for sure it will influence us for a period of time. If this is ongoing or not, so that is still a question mark. We need to see it. Well, looking into the future, we have a lot of practice right now and it's still the situation is developing. But we are looking at the future about tourism, about the cultural sectors. So what will uh, change or uh, what still and change? That's some of the thought so far. For example, the new normal. We're talking about the new normals all the time about travel. So are we traveling the same way as before or we're trying to change a little bit or some new phenomena emerging from this pandemic? That's something we need to think about. So for example, vacation, we just mentioned this before, and this is, yes, it's quite a new uh, phenomenon right now. Many people still, uh, you know, go to some hotels, result locally, just to have a bit of like feeling of traveling, but, you know, within the hotel rooms, within the result, but they still can have kind of experiences of travel, okay? And some of the people, they stay at home, but they have a virtual tour uh, globally to go to different museums, have different themes. So that is also kind of uh, a staycation. Also for the flights, you know, we have different I, uh, flight com uh, uh, airway companies, they having the staycation. It's a fly to nowhere and then back in, in three hours. Just give you a feeling of fly to fulfill the needs of the people, you know, we have the desire to travel no matter how. And also this is a, a, a very new uh, product I found the other day uh, when I was trying to find for my family in the UK, so like staycations on the cruise. And it used to be a very fantastic one, the, uh, I think. I tried this in Florida 10 years ago. But um, this is a full station. They are going nowhere. You embark on, on, on Southampton and you get on the sea for uh, three to uh, four days and then you are back to Southampton. You are not uh, going to land anywhere else. You can enjoy the facilities, those musicals, concerts, and those uh, uh, Disney culture in a very in-depth approach. Okay? So this is uh, very good for kids or for family. And also there's a lot of... Uh, 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 cruise ships with the theme of culture, art, or music. Uh, or music. So this is all different examples showing us in staycation, we can still embrace this culture, different kind of culture, but it just you, you, you stay there. Okay. But I have to say this provides you a very in-depth way to understand our culture. Okay. Since um, uh, if without the pandemic, we sometimes go around and look at things in a very superficial way, but here we have the chance to really have the in-depth travel to understand a place or a culture. And the P2P platform, this is already emerging uh, even before the pandemic. And of course, for the, for example, accommodation sector, Airbnb, um, they all suffered because of the limit to travel. But um, after you know, those kind of restrictions has been lifted, I think the P2P platforms have these advantages to get recovered and to address the customer's needs uh, with some of the, uh, those uh, reasons li uh, listed here. So for example, it's more flexible okay? and it's not getting a lot of group of people together. So it reduces the risk of being infected and it could provide you a lot of personalization in their products and give you some privacy. For example, one group, one party in one apartment. And you can to build up a trust with the host, if you, for example, in the Airbnb. So that will reduce the social, you know, uncertainty or trust between the tourist and, and the host. And with the innovation and novelty seeking, um, that really fulfill the tourist, uh, uh, those their needs. 
And I just want to mention, not only Airbnb uh, part of the P2P platform, for the tourism sectors, um, there's a lot of other players in, uh, in this uh, platform. For example, with locals, this is a very uh, interesting you know, P2P platforms uh, linking the local tour guide and the, the tourist together on this page. So they are all you know, um, individual, they're not companies. So the tour guides are from the local people who have a good understanding of the local culture, different attractions, places. So they get on board and the people, a tourist, they can select their um, a tour guide from their, and they're looking at their background, their jobs, their interest. So they get together on, on this platform. So they go out. So this is a very flexible way to travel in the destination in their own way. And another uh, thing we probably need to concern uh, is apart from the social cultural perspective is about the personal relationship. Uh, in our case, it's about the tourist residence relationship. Um, so it makes us to reflect a little bit. Is that the pandemic encouraging the poor social behaviors or it encourage those antisocial behaviors between these two groups? And if we are looking at different news, um, a lot of things, also we, we know that within the group, within the community, we are getting more coherent. We are trying to support each other within one society, but there's a lot of news coming out from different countries about uh, antisocial behavior triggered by this pandemic. For example, uh, on the left-hand side, it shows the, um, the hate crime, okay? those crimes uh, induced by the hate um, towards uh, targeting the Asian tourists, uh, in the in America is to increase dramatically from 2019 to, to 2020. Okay. So that's mainly because of the uh, outbreak of, of COVID-19 and uh, people, you know, go on the street and the same hate is a virus. So which means those kind of pandemic, they tend to create those kind of stereotypes between tourists and hosts. And this is not really healthy, uh, even beyond the COVID-19. Okay. Since if you have very bad relationships, tourists will not go to your destination, no matter how good you are. Okay. So this is very dangerous and very challenging, but induced by this COVID-19. And the last part I want to talk about regarding the culture is about the uh, authenticity. So even though we have a lot of technologies we could use, we still travel during this uh, lockdown, but is that really the same feeling or same experiences you may have, you know, between and after, right? Online, is that virtual really a substitute for the real travel or is just a supplement for the real travel? If you're considering about different features, online visitation, okay? And uh, what kind of authenticity you may have, you're not touching, you know, those uh, piece of work, or you're not visiting those sites, you don't have the sounds around, you don't have the, uh, the atmosphere around, uh, you're not physically there. So what you, you feel is authentic, you are told by those tour guide, or you is created online. So it's um, more about constructive authenticity. So what about the, those objective authenticity? So that is still a question mark on the main influence in our experiences. And uh, it's particularly true for those uh, social interactions, like uh, performance, or you want to know the lifestyle of the local people, you want to visit their public park to see what they're doing for their daily life. But now you may not have the chance to do that. So the social bit in the culture is uh, largely uh, you know, missing in this part. No immersion, in immersion, yes, only online may not give you a very comprehensive experiences all over. So low immersion may also influence our experiences. Okay. So uh, I think that's all I want to uh, express today, but uh, now is the question time. So very happy to answer any of the questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daisy, for your uh, in-depth explanations about your, your presentations. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we proceed with the questions from the participants, I have uh, questions uh, for you uh, regarding the, uh, I think you are velvet about this, about the Brexit, yeah? The Brexit in UK uh, and on how this uh, Brexit uh, strategy is actually impacting the hospitality and tourism in the United States. Uh, uh, 
this uh, or debate for this for quite a long time. So I think uh, the most important influence so far is about the labor, the employability for hospitality and the tourism industry. Um, since um, I think this statistics is about the employer, uh, employees in this sector, mm -hmm. the majority are from like uh, European countries. Okay, um, so not locally British, which means after the Brexit, um, those uh, people are from the European countries. They need to hold a visa to come and work, not as before. They are working free. There's no restriction. They do not need any visa or something to work and live in the UK. So this is a very big challenge until now. And also, um, I think for those um, plus COVID-19, this is really a big gap. Yeah, since the, during COVID-19, so uh, we have a lot of staff, especially the you know, part-time staff, mm. um, they lose their job since we don't need them. But now if uh, we are not getting, you know, uh, opening up the industry, um, the industry, you really have a hard time to recruit back those staff, you know, from this uh, before the pandemic. Yeah. So the Brexit plus the, the pandemic makes the employability here a uh, quite challenging thing. All right. Thank you, Dr. Daisy. It's a precise uh, answer from, from Dr. Daisy. All right. I would like to take the questions from uh, our participants. Uh, the first question is from Sidi Tuka. Uh, from Anira Bali, yeah, mm -hmm. Dr. Daisy fan. I saw on television during the 2021. I have the same question actually, and yeah. uh, it's about the 2021 Euro Championships. Uh, many people, uh, public opinions, mm -hmm. while the pandemic of it 80, uh, 19 had not slowed down. What really happened is the related to tourist culture. So uh, from from the questions, I also have. Uh, I'm a big fan of football in UK, uh -huh. and of course, definitely Arsenal is my my my. Arsenal is my team, and of course, definitely a numbers of uh, Arsenal players <laughs> uh, playing in the in that uh, Brit uh, England uh, squad. And when we see people uh, actually gathering around in Euro, yeah, Euro, because now we we know mm. uh, uh, England is actually is going to for the final with Italy. This is we are going yeah. to. I mean, you see a uh, 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 number of uh, I mean, thousands thousands of people is going to watch that 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 game. And then, uh, of course, definitely the uh, physical distancing and definitely the rules and regulations. How, how do you see this thing, uh, Dr. Daisy? <laughs> oh. Thank you for this. A very timely issue. Yes, it's uh, these days, even though I don't really watch every game, but you can really hear that from your neighbors for every yeah. match. Okay, yeah. You don't need to watch it. You know what time they get to go in since they shot. <laughs> so that's like a national game, I have to yes. say. Yeah. So yeah, every time after the England team, um, they they get a, a game, they get a, like a, a match. So there's a lot of gathering, of course, especially for the not only the young people, not students, but you know, middle age, every age range, they go out, go to the pub. So they have mm -hmm. a cultural tradition to go to the pub and drink the beer and uh, watch those uh, those uh, matches. So that really actually created concern. But that's something, you know, um, we do not have really any solutions. But many of them, if it's good to sit outdoors, so it's uh, better. But many of the pubs, they're still inside. Okay? So this creates a lot of, you know, risk to, uh, like, enhance those kind of uh, infection. Um, and we also, after the games, people go out to the square, to the, the, the parks, to celebrate, to the beach, yeah. like in Bromos. They go out to the beach. So this is really getting it, it make it even worse um but i have to say there's not m much measures or regulations for those kind of actions but i can really see the risk since uh, i think for the statics even though you get the um, maybe first dose of the vaccination you still get the chance to be infected uh, mm. get covid 19. so um that's really concerned me, actually, but I'm not sure for the local people, but it's really a big concern. But as you know, the, later on, I think in, in nine days, um, the whole country is going to release all those uh, measures, the yeah, regulations. Yeah. 19, so is so, it 19, right? 19 of July, right? 19 of so July. It, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean... I mean, you. I think the United Kingdom has taken a, 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 a very strategic measure uh, an in-depth analysis in order for them to release this uh, mm -hmm. rules and regulation on the 19th of July, yeah, Dr. Daisy? Mm -hmm. I believe yeah. that, yeah? 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, stringent and uh, uh, rules and regulation, SOPs, all those things have to be been taken uh, into consideration when they are making mm-hmm. this decision to on the 19th of July that they are going to we are going to be like in a normal situation uh, yes. like before. Right. So thank you, Dr. Daisy, for your uh, uh, insights and your 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 sharing with us. And uh, all right. You. So thank you, Dr. Daisy. So uh, next, we are going to uh, go to the last uh, presentation uh, by uh, Mr. James Bivans uh, from the Marriott International Hotel. I just like to read a bit about the backgrounds of Mr. James Bivans. And um, all right, Mr. Bivans, yeah. Uh, is a general manager at the Marriott International Hotel Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, and he graduated from the, the University College Birmingham study in hotel management institutional operation back in 1984 and 1986. Mr. Vivan has an over 25 years experience in the international hotel management with, uh, a, uh, with uh, a general manager and group director rules, specializing in pre-opening from contractors interior designer relationship, uh, pro- uh, project management to operations, 12, 12 international hotels is quite, uh, I mean, a good resume here. Extensive knowledge and expertise gained in concept development, hotel operations, luxury residences, business development, optimal revenue management, and strategic planning. Experience in dealing with diverse culture around the world. But without further ado, I would like to welcome our uh, Mr. James uh, Bivans to, uh, before that, I would like to, 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 to share with you the topic uh, that is going to be presented by uh, uh, Mr. Bivans, that is the um, job opportunities within the hospitality industry after the pandemic. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. James Bivan to the floor, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Johanna Dean. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see that you're a... Uh, a football fan, and me coming from the United Kingdom and coming yeah. from England, I'll be supporting England uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. For that. Yeah. Well, what's your team? Before that, what's your team? <laughs> your club. <laughs> your club, Mr. Vivens. My club, club, Birmingham City. Oh, yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well known, but not, not a top team, but one day we'll get back to the top. Hopefully. I think, yeah, I think a few times they're actually in the Premier League, I think, Birmingham. Yes. Yeah. 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 When I was a boy and a few years ago, but let's hope for better times for Birmingham. Yeah. All right. Okay. Please proceed. Thank you. Let, let you know that I spent a few years in in Bournemouth at the start of my career, Daisy. So it's a wonderful. <laughs> it's a wonderful town, Bournemouth. I have such good uh, memories. You know, working in Ferndown, just outside of Bournemouth. So. Oh yeah, I know it. Oh, that's great. But very not part of the world. Anybody visiting England should really try and and take a trip down to Bournemouth. It's really a beautiful part of the world. Yeah. Part nice. of that. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 but, but there is one team from Bournemouth, right? Bournemouth FC Football Club as well. Right. Uh, yeah. James, yeah, I think. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, they um, amazing. When I when I first went to Bournemouth, they were in the the third division. Now they're in the yeah. Premier. So it's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Mm, yeah. yeah. So welcome everybody and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to to speak today. And um, today I just, if you could move to the next slide please. Uh, Today I'd just like to talk to you quickly about the JW Marriott Kuala Lumpur and also what we've been doing here at the JW Marriott during the pandemic. Um, Also the hotel industry and what we expect. Um, our hiring strategy moving forward, Marriott International and how we develop our associates and um, opportunities with Marriott, um, how we've changed as a hotel and a company during the, the pandemic. And I just wanted to at the end tell you how great it is to be a hotelier So, and what you can gain from being a hotelier. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give this up, you this uh, opportunity to understand the JW Marriott and we have 738 guest rooms. Uh, we have many restaurants uh, around the hotel and two ballrooms. We're also connected to the Star Hill uh, shopping mall, which is a luxury shopping mall and connected by walkway to the Ritz Carlton. So this is all in one complex located, uh, next slide please. 
in the Bukit Bintang area, which is really in the heart of Kuala Lumpur. It's really a popular area, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and it's um, not far from the Twin Towers and next to the Pavilion Shopping Mall. So our location is really a second to none. Also, I just wanted to mention that Marriott International has 7,642 properties in 130 countries around the world. And we even have 30 properties in Malaysia alone. So it's such a big organization, actually. Uh, next slide, please. And this is um, one of our um, guest rooms. Uh, all our rooms are newly renovated and are in a very good uh, uh, condition. And um, yeah, they're very well appointed. So all the guests are very comfortable in our rooms. And just to let you know that before the pandemic, this hotel was running 90% occupancy throughout the year. So um, a tremendous amount of business and popularity for this hotel. And I think you'll find that most hotels in Kuala Lumpur run very good occupancy. Um, Malaysia is very uh, interesting in terms of tourism because it's very attractive to, to most countries in the world. Uh, the British tourists love to go there because of the colonial past. Um, the Middle Eastern guests feel very comfortable here in Malaysia, you know, because of the religion, uh, while there is a huge population of Chinese speakers, so um, we, we can see a, a, a large number of people coming from mainland China now. So it's really a wonderful country for, for tourism, and it, it seems to be um, popular for all, all, um, all countries, actually, as a destination. Uh, next slide, please. So having said that, we have a lot of restaurants throughout the hotel that cater to all these travelers. We have two Middle Eastern restaurants. We have a Japanese, Cantonese, Shanghainese. Uh, we have a global cuisine as well. And the picture uh, here shows our newly renovated restaurant, which is in the lower level, um, which is part of our Star Hill Dining, which is a complex of different um, restaurants, um, including a very popular uh, Look You Tea House, which does wonderful dim sum. Uh, next slide, please. And I just wanted to showcase quickly our ballroom, which can accommodate up to 800, and is a real popular destination for weddings and, and of course, uh, conferences and meetings. We have another uh, 18 different meeting rooms and we all have also have a second uh, smaller ballroom as well. So as you can see, this, this hotel is uh, very large and, and obviously needs a, a big workforce to, to operate this hotel day in and day out. Uh, next slide, please. So what has been happening at the JW Marriott during the pandemic? Well, the good news for us is, and this cannot be said for a lot of hotels in, in Malaysia, is that we've We've been able to keep our associates. Our owner, our local owner, has been committed to keep all the associates uh, in a job, which has been great. Even though the JW Marriott has been closed since March 2020, he's um, made a commitment to keep everyone in employment. Um, luckily, we do have the Ritz-Carlton, which is still open, so some of my associates have gone to work at the Ritz-Carlton and also the owner has some different resorts and hotels around um, Malaysia so on occasion we've been able to support those other hotels. We did open for six weeks in December 2020 and thinking of, of what's going to happen in the future it was very interesting to see that as soon as we opened our doors uh, we were fully booked uh, there was definitely a pent-up demand for people to, to travel uh, domestically in Malaysia. I think by December 2020, everyone was fed up, and when we could open our doors, everybody wanted to get away and enjoy a break with their families. So that's a good indication that uh, the business will come back. Uh, next slide, please. So even though our owner was committed to keep all the colleagues uh, all the associates, 
we did have a reduction in associates by about 50%. And this was because there was some small salary reduction and there's no tips and gratuities for the staff. You know, if you think about the positions like the, the concierge and the bellmen, they rely on their tips. And uh, a lot of staff uh, indicated to me that they missed their usual assignment. They missed having their proper job. And also for a lot of people, it was an opportunity to try something new. And I think hotel associates are always in demand because of their excellent training and their excellent customer service skills. So although we were committed to um, keeping all the associates, there was uh, quite a lot of reduction, which is good for graduates uh, who are interested to come into the industry. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we think about the industry and what's going to happen? Well, we feel that there's a very strong sentiment to travel. Um, so we expect that there'll be a big rebound in travel at the end of 2021 and into 2022. There is also some buying power because um, people have been in lockdown, their lives have changed, there's been no eating out, no holidays, and we feel less expenses. So um, we can also see that uh, countries across the world have begun to loosen their travel restrictions this summer. Earlier this week, Germany became the most recent country to reopen borders with the US and the UK for leisure travelers. Also, we expect to see as soon as the numbers in Malaysia go down, and we, we, we're hoping to open our doors in, in August, um, sometime in August, we look forward to welcoming domestic travel back, um, then followed by humanitarian travel, which means that people will be traveling to reunite with families, with their family members, um, followed by business travel. And there's a new segment we're interested in, which we, we like to call pleasure. We do think that more and more business travelers, they like to combine their business travel with some leisure. And, you know, Malaysia is uh, such a, a wonderful place to experience all the culture and the food and everything you have to offer. So we really want to make sure that we're geared up for this, this uh, pleasure traveler. And then finally, we hope that uh, groups and uh, meetings and incentives will come back and, uh, and pick up in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So what is our hiring strategy? Well, we'd like to promote with within. Uh, we feel that we have um, an opportunity uh, to, to uh, develop and, and promote the associates we already have. Um, and then we'd like to look at hiring fresh graduates. Why do we prefer fresh graduates? Well, we like to mold them into the way we want and they won't have any bad habits from previous employees. And we get to teach them the Marriott International Standards for Hotel Management from the beginning. So we're very keen to hire fresh graduates um, moving forward. And we also like to fast track our associates. You know, there are so many opportunities in so many different areas of the hotel. So there's a real need to train and fast track associates so there's never been a better time to get into the hotel industry and to be able to develop, develop very quickly and get to the next uh, level very quickly. When I was a, a young man starting in this industry, usually you expected to work 18 months to two years in one position before you were given an opportunity to progress, but that's not the case anymore. Uh, rapid progression is, is definitely an opportunity for everybody. So Marriott uh, International have a lot of um, uh, training and development plans for associates. So the first one is the symphony of service, which is um, for all supervisors and managers for high guest contact associates. And it gives them the tools and the skills to give the uh, approachable luxury service that we want all our guests to feel. So that's a, a, a wonderful program. So everyone can really understand what it is to, to serve in a luxury hotel environment. We have amazing online learning uh, programs which have been developed for all Marriott hotels around the world. 
And of course, we have a lot of experienced local and international managers working here who can, can um, uh, pass on their experience of many years. So, so nobody better to learn from than an experienced professional who, who you're working with uh, in your department day in and day out. And of course, one of our big focuses is what we call commitment to clean, which is where um, Marriott International developed a program on hygiene and health of all the employees. So we've put a lot of time and effort into making sure that we uh, sterilize and, and hygiene every, every area is clean. And we have a huge commitment and there's a big training program with nine modules that all the colleagues must go through. Um, so there's definitely a comfort level for our guests when they come back that um, the hotel is very, very clean and, and, uh, and hygienic. Uh, next slide, please. So there are so many opportunities. This is some advertising from Ritz-Carlton for the what they call their associates, ladies and gentlemen. And you can see a very happy chef there on the left side. So, of course... The wonderful thing about the hotel industry, there are so many disciplines. There are so many different jobs to choose from. I mean, we have front office and loyalty, and then we have an executive lounge. We have certain positions for people that don't want to be customer facing, don't feel confident, like the telephone operator and in-room dining and at your service. And then we have those famous uh, departments like the concierge who organize everyone's travel and their and their tourist attractions, etc. And we have an amazing opportunity in our culinary department with, with all our different restaurants and to learn all those different cuisines. And of course, some people prefer housekeeping. And then not to forget, we have uh, really well-established sales and marketing and, and finance at the highest level, which are all supported by the international uh, standards uh, developed by Marriott. So there's really opportunities for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So during this time, how have we changed? Well, we have, as I mentioned, uh, complex in, in our complex, we have the Star Hill, which is a luxury uh, shopping mall, which uh, has Louis Vuitton and Tom Ford and Philip Patek, uh, to name a few of the luxury brands we have which will definitely attract uh, the, the local and the international travelers once we reopen. Then we have the Star Hill Dining, which is a, an array of different restaurants that's completely newly renovated as well. And we've actually added an additional 160 guest rooms. So that means our, our inventory has gone up. So it means our pricing uh, has to be adjusted slightly, it means that uh, staying at the JW Marriott will be um, much more affordable than in the past. Um, we've also added extra meeting rooms and we've, got, we've had new concepts. We've also spent this time in looking at the staff structure. Our owner has also been very involved in that to see how we can do things, how we can streamline our business and, and how we can structure our hotel more efficiently. And we're looking, looking to develop new markets in, in sales and marketing. And um, as I mentioned, a lot of improvements in, in, in the hardware as well. Um, and next slide, please. We're also pleased to announce that we have a co-working space that we've developed. So we're excited to welcome new and small businesses, freelancers, remote workers and commuters. We think that this is the future, and uh, we have a very large co-working space to uh, enable these freelancers and these remote workers to collaborate uh, in, a, in a modern working space, but also at the same time uh, use all the facilities that the JW Marriott has to offer. So we're very excited. We're ready to, to operate that as soon as the hotel doors open. And last slide, please. So I just wanted to thank you and uh, just explain to you that being a hotelier for me has been a, a wonderful journey. I've had a lot of uh, satisfaction, great camaraderie and friends I've, I've developed throughout the years. And I've been able to work in nearly all corners of the world, actually. 
and uh, learn the different cultures. So I encourage anyone that's interested in joining this fantastic uh, industry, there's never a better time to join now. There'll be so many wonderful opportunities and the opportunity also to, to uh, develop and fast track your career, definitely with the hotel industry as it rebounds in 2021 and 2022. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, it was a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. James Vivan, for your insights and uh, uh, in-depth explanation about uh, what is going on right now. And I have, um, all right, before we proceed with the questions, I have a questions from the participants. And um, before I proceed, uh, I have the same, what I call, um, feeling when you are the Bone Boy uh, members, I'm a Bone Boy members, and they keep on like sending you the, the promotions. Well, so it, it becomes like, I, I like my, my, my favorite place is, uh, I love Langkawi. That is my place. That is my heaven. That is my, uh, I can say heaven for me. <laughs> I love Langkawi. Uh, so uh, they, they keep up like always uh, send me the, the, the brochures, uh, send me the, the uh, what they call, from the emails, and of course, uh, the, 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 from the uh, Bonvoy ap application. So uh, it seems that we hope that the uh, pandemic is going to, uh, I mean, the numbers going down and people be allowed to travel. So as like I suggested, as I've suggested before, uh, say for example, like I have this, uh, 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 when I read the reports, yeah, uh, I look at the, I did some analysis towards the, uh, what is going on right now. Uh, as from my opinion, the regions that actually, it's actually from the northern regions, say for example, uh, Perlis, uh, Penang, uh, Kedah, and of course, uh, Pera is actually now, the numbers uh, of COVID-19 cases has already gone down. And the region is actually, can travel among them itself. So, and definitely Langkawi is going to open as well like in the east, uh, the Tarangano, Kelantan, and Pang, of course, the several regions. And of course, uh, the down south, like uh, west region, Kuala Lumpur, Putrajaya, and Selangor. Of course, now they're having uh, lots of cases. And going down to, to south is uh, south, south uh, region, that is Johor, Malacca, and Negris Milan as well, right? So what I can see is maybe we, I do not know, maybe we, the, the government should look into the how are we going to, to open the economy towards the uh, places that is actually recorded number of, low number of cases. Say, say for example, uh, northern part is actually, uh, the numbers is quite, uh, it's, it's controllable actually. All right, so before we uh, go for the questions, yeah, uh, I would like to read, uh, from CD Bayou, from CD Bayou, uh, the question is: Does your hotel also implement employee reduction and replace the role by accepting more trainees? What is your view on the role of trainees during this COVID nineteen pandemic, James? Yeah, we we um, we really think trainees play a very important role, and um, I must say, in, when I started in in my career. Uh, trainees seem to be a burden, you know. Um, uh, you people were reluctant to put any time and effort into into having trainees in the hotel. But um, my thought is that these are the future um, workforce; they're the future employees for my hotel. So it's important for me to um, give them uh, a proper experience during their training. Um, spend the time to train them properly because I really believe that they will come back after they finish their training, after they finish their college, and they can be your future employees. So I think they play a very important role. And um, actually, um, you know, if you invest a little time in them and invest a little training in them, we find that they're, they're very quick to pick up and, and to be able to be helped, a help to us. Um, in December, we had uh, a number of trainees that came and, and, and helped us, and the hotel was completely full, and we had a reduced workforce. So we had to get those trainees involved very quickly. And um, within seven working days, they were greeting guests, they were helping with check-in, we're helping all around the hotel. So I think they have a big role to play. And definitely in the JW Marriott, we, we take um, a trainee seriously. We give them a proper orientation. 
and uh, we make sure that they're involved and they're part of our workforce. All right, thank you, James. Uh, for the last questions, uh, we know merit is one of the biggest among, among the, I mean, I can see the one of the biggest uh, hotel chains in the world, right? So uh, what is your role as uh, one of the biggest uh, hotel, chain hotel in the world towards that helping, uh, I mean, you you have, you have more than more than 100 over uh, hotels property around the world uh, how do you from the headquarters in united states uh try to assist uh the people who are like, the employee of course definitely the hotels around the world in a global global scale yeah that's a very good question we have um a marriott business council here that all the general managers are part of and we speak once a month and we see how we can help um, uh, the country that we're in. So um, here we we did a lot of uh, producing food for, for, for the nurses and the doctors during the beginning of the pandemic. And then, of course, we're very much into protecting the environment. So every month we have to... Uh, a report back to the uh, business council on our activities and how we've helped Malaysia and how we've helped the people. And um, we kind of work together. Um, for example, we went to some, um, uh, before the pandemic, uh, we, we joined a food drive in some um, uh, poorer parts of, uh, of Kuala Lumpur and we spent the day uh, giving food out to to the locals you know so that's one of the initiatives we did as well so and there are initiatives we have a number of Marriott resorts so they of course want to look after the the, the wildlife and and and, uh, and the countryside there so that's part of their initiative so yeah that's that's something that we have to do as a Marriott business council based in Kuala Lumpur um, but then we have to report that back to Marriott International in, in the States. Uh, the other thing is that we have um, a Marriott Disaster Relief Fund where Marriott Inter International gives um, funding to, um, uh, to countries in need. So actually, the, uh, our council here in Malaysia, we requested funds and um, we were able to, to um, receive some, some uh, funds to be able to buy shopping vouchers for some of the associates in in uh, Malaysia, Marriott associates in Malaysia, who have uh, are on the lower end of the pay scale, yeah. so anyone who earns a lower salary, maybe it's a lower uh, uh, job, um, their name will be listed, and they they are um, able to receive shopping vouchers. So every month they get this team together. Uh, I get sent the money to the hotel bank account and then I buy them shopping vouchers. And um, they really appreciate that because it just gives them a little bit of um, extra food to to put on the table for their families, you know, during these difficult times. So those are a couple of ways that we, that Marriott International supports the local community and, and our local colleagues. All right, thank you, James, for your uh, explanations about that. And all right, so uh, I think we have uh, finished the, the sessions for five uh, distinguished guests that we have today. And uh, just to wrap up, I mean, just to, to look into the, the first uh, from uh, Professor Dellin, uh, he was talking about the American uh, uh, USA in terms of uh, how they manage the, the pandemic uh, in, in the United States. And uh, Mr. Dow uh, talking about the Malaysian healthcare and how are we going to go further uh, on this possible uh, 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 development towards the pandemic. And the third speaker, Professor Dama, talking about Bali, talking about strategies and talking about the government assistance bar from the from the Indonesian government. And uh, Dr. Daisy talking about the UK, uh, talking about the culture and of course, a bit of explanation on the Brexit as well, uh, talking about the uh, Europe as well. And then we, uh, from Mr. 
James Biban were basically uh, uh, based in, in Kuala Lumpur. We we're talking about the job opportunities and within the hospitality industry after the pandemic and uh, his insights on how the uh, global Marriott uh, Medical Council, something like that, uh, is going, uh, is actually helping the community in uh, the region that, that they are operating. All right. Uh, so, with that, I thank you very much to all participants and thank you very much to all distinguished guests. Yeah, Mr. Daud, uh, Prof. Dellen. Uh, Mr. James Bivans, the general manager of uh, Merit Kuala Lumpur, Professor Dharma Putra from Bali, uh, hello. And I was I was informed that this uh, uh, this 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 webinar is actually uh, uh, aired and uh, tele live telecast around the world. It's actually we have uh, I mean more than uh, I mean thousands of uh, participants looking at the YouTube as well. So it's becoming like a, a very nice and a very uh, a proper uh, international webinar. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you. Uh, and I would like to hand over this session to Mr. Najmi. Mr. Najmi. All right, Dr. Johan. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Dr. Johanuddin Wahab for moderating the webinar and all the distinguished speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, before we end our session, we would like to introduce today's webinar organizing committee and after that, we will have a group photo session. We would like to seek your cooperation to please switch on your cameras to have a group photo together. All right, ready guys? One, two, three. Okay, move to the next page. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, move to the third page. One, two, three. Now we move to the last page. One, two, three. All right. Thank you to all of you. Members of the webinar, we seek your cooperation from all participants to so please provide us your feedback. You may scan the QR code on the screen. receive an e-certificate as sign of our appreciation. If you did not receive the e-certificate, kindly email us and we will respond to you accordingly. Also, please be informed that only completion of feedback will receive the recorded link of the session. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of our webinar. We would like to thank to all of our distinguished speakers, Professor Dr. Dallin J. Timothy, Mr. Muhammad Dawood Muhammad Arif, Professor Dr. Dharma Putra, Dr. Desi Fen, and Mr. James Bivens for sharing an awesome and fruitful ideas and thoughts on the theme of preparing industry towards foreseeable unexpected events lessons during COVID-19 pandemic. Once again, we would like to express our gratitude to our Head of Centers of Study, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, Associate Professor, Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin, Rector, University of Technology Mara Pulau Pinang, Professor Technologist, Dr. Salamia Kasolang, Moderator of today's webinar, Associate Professor, Dr. Joharuddin Wahab, and not to forget, special thanks to our advisors, 
of today's webinar, Associate Professor Dr. Azila Azbi and Mr. Zamri Ahmad, who are the key persons behind the scenes, navigating every phase in ensuring the smooth running of this event. Thank you again. We would we will also would like to express our sincere gratitude to University of Technology Mara, Pulau Pinang, for co-hosting this event. Finally, we would like to thank to all of, of our participants for joining us today. We sincerely hope that all of you benefited from the session and able to take home some points and insights on how industry prepared toward in, towards possible and expected events based on the current situation of COVID-19 pandemic. We wish you a pleasant weekend and do not forget to scan our feedback form. Thank you and assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Prof. Dharma. Thank you, James. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you, Chidharma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Maybe we can start taking picture. Let us stop recording ni. Shafika masih live lagi kan? Shafika masih live lagi kan? Ya, Doktor. Masih live ya? Eh? 